What's up guys, Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. We are back in the office, been traveling, did some podcasts and didn't have my camera, but I wish I did because I uh, have been called out by Logan Paul. Weird turn of events and I have to respond to it. It is a odd scenario to say the least. He uh, randomly tagged me, like I've never talked to the guy in my life, to be clear. And I just get tagged in this random DM and in my notifications, I see a couple of people saying, Logan Paul called you out. I'm like, oh, fantastic. So I see this and in the, you know, preview thing, he doesn't, send, he doesn't send me anything specifically. He just tags me. So then it goes into my DMs, but he knows I'm going to see it. And at a glance, I'm like, what is this giant image that just has like highlight marks all over it? So I open it up. Logan has gone on a multi-story, I don't even know if you call it like a mini tirade or not, but he uh, is basically reposting an email that their customer support or whatever got with a anecdotal, you know, review of prime hydration from Kyle, last name starting with a T. Urgent, thank you for my nine-year-old son. I wanted to reach out to you in regards to how your product has greatly impacted the health of my nine-year-old son. Attached is a pic of my son, Ethan. So this is the picture, uh, wholesome. So he's holding up a prime, uh, I don't know, like rocket pop or something. Over the last year or so, Ethan has been suffering from headaches, nausea, weakness, and other signs of dehydration, even though drinking plenty of liquids throughout the day. This had severely impacted his school and sports participation as well as just normal play as a kid. The doctor had ran some basic tests and done diet changes and all, but nothing seemed to do anything more than help a little. My older son plays high school football and has used your drink frequently and had raved about the flavor, but we never knew exactly what the drink would mean until recently. Ethan was having one of the days of the symptoms mentioned above, and as we picked up my older son from workouts, he had some of his prime hydration drink left and gave it to Ethan. Within minutes, he perked up, had his color back, headache had went away and was back to himself. And then, you know, Logan tags at Drink Prime. And then he also tags my ass on the next one. At more plates, more dates. Stupid virgin. Looking online, I had seen the videos saying it was underdosed or didn't have certain ingredients. So on and so on from the so-called experts. The more plates, more dates type videos. I can tell you it's completely false. It has truly changed the daily life and well-being of my nine-year-old son, Ethan. And we now give him one daily and something, something, summer camp and something, something, one day of headaches or any other symptoms. Even his doctor supports him using the drink and loves the results he's had. He loves the ice pop one the most, which around here can be hard to find at our local Kroger and Walmart. So I try to buy several when I see them, even if I don't always have the money, but he likes the green ones as well. Again, I wanted to thank you and your company for what your products has meant to us. As a father, the most important thing to me is my children. And when something is going on health-wise, it truly becomes a stop the world to make it better scenario. As Ethan, Ethan's father, I truly thank you. Kyle, Ethan's father. So a glowing review, and that's awesome that Ethan has something that's working for him now. Um, that's fantastic. And we'll get into the science of why I think it's the case because it should be talked about, by the way, if somebody literally needs a prime to function, there is an underlying issue that should be addressed. And we'll get into that with, you know, blood work and urine analysis in a sec here. But with Logan, I, I can't get over the psychology of this still, you know, you make these videos, you know, shitting on other companies with horrendous misrepresented statements that are completely misleading incorrect, lack any science and rigor. And instead of going into, you know, the literature, finding a good meta analysis, doing something of value that somehow reinforces the efficacy of your product. Instead, you find an email from, you know, some kid's dad and post it on your story. And you go, somebody who's not psychologically phased by anything online with all the shit going on with Logan right now, the guy literally covers up a piece of the email to make sure he tags me and calls me a stupid virgin. Like, you know how much more you could have said without having to say anything by just posting the email, you know? Like you just post the email and as some sort of, uh, it's already, you know, questionable that you're using this as your proof of concept and why your drink is so great. But to make sure you go out of your way to make sure it hits my inbox too and I, you get that tag in there, the psychology. You know, is it a marketing tactic? He knows I'm gonna make a response video. 
I don't know, but it's like, it's not like this response rate is going to be favorable, I would think, because it's just going to be, this is going to be a complete dismemberment this time. Like I've done, you know, the scientific dismantlement videos, but like this is going to be a, I would say a high level primer, no pun intended, masterclass introduction to hydration and what is a completely shitty formula, what's a good formula, and kind of dissecting the industry, because this is a very, very confusing industry. And it's not easy science to understand either. It's not something that uh, a lot of people really grasp, because there are paradoxical outcomes to some of these formulas. And, you know, I would be shocked if Logan even understands fucking anything about his products, to be honest. Like, I just don't think he knows what's going on. So, you know, he gets sent, sent something from, you know, his PR team or whatever, and, you know, hits hits me with a fucking tag, and then goes on to claim that everyone who's made a video debunking his stuff is therefore stupid and, you know, potentially a stupid virgin as well. Like, we just don't know anything. All the experts, you know, so-called experts. Logan is the one who should be educating us about hydration at the end of the day. So what was I thinking was going to happen next? I thought I was going to have a, you know, complete onslaught of Logan fans in my DMs, on my posts, something of significance given he has over 26 million followers and he went out of his way to literally tag me in what is otherwise like a, a like it's it's a clearly negative light anyone who sees this and on his story presumably he gets millions of views i would think this would result in a lot of people coming to my page to shit on me on his behalf as fans of his take a wild guess drop a comment down below of how many people you think came to defend him because it surprised me you know i thought it would be something relatively significant but it wasn't you know it wasn't a thousand people which you know is completely reasonable to think that it could be that many it wasn't a hundred people which you're already like okay well that's not very much considering his following and how many people he's hit with this post it wasn't even 10 people it was fucking one person <laughs> i had luke Bacaro in my inbox you're literally on roids you cheating fuck face virgin like <laughs> like that was the extent of it not, I don't even think there was one person who commented on my fucking screenshot of the, you know, him posting this. I posted on my feed, hit the situation, uh, made a little, you know, poked some fun at it. And that was it, dude. Fucking Luke Bacaro. Um, looks like that's the only one that's got Logan's back on this one. So the interesting thing, though, about this, you know, above and beyond the uh, how comical it is in general, it's uh, the fact that he has gone out of his way to say explicitly essentially you know indirectly that all of the videos from the so-called experts are wrong incorrect stupid and here is proof that our product is great so that's you know fantastic and we're, we'll get into why that isn't the case and this guy just needs to understand how to take constructive criticism for once like do you do you think we're all just clout chasing and this isn't just you know something maybe some of these people do otherwise anyways review formulas that are you know highly requested or just don't make sense. Obviously there is some level of putting your name in a title and getting some sort of attention to it. But if this was a formula that was backed by responsible, fair marketing practices and was not misleadingly shitting on other companies and making claims that are not just, you know, it's not just that the formula is sub efficacious. It's the complete misrepresentation of what it's for and the shitting of other companies on other companies in order to prop yourself up above them as you're trying to climb the ranks. Like you are the one Logan who is clout chasing these other companies, putting them on blast with nonsense like you don't understand how your formula works you don't know why it doesn't work you don't know why fucking anything's going on you're just going by tit for tat this is how many electrolytes are in it we also have a bcaa we have this like please make a response video explaining hydration formulas i would fucking love to see it so like recently prime has gone on a tear sponsoring some top tier athletes which is great you know for their exposure and whatnot but it's like this is the exact thing that also reinforces the misleading marketing because these guys are just not going to fucking use it. You know, there are a lot of experts online, not, not me necessarily that are talking about this and saying the same things. This is not, you know, there are people I'm sure even Logan would respect in the space who have come to the same conclusions, including one, the fucking dietitian of one of, of the two first athletes you actually sponsored the two ufc superstars who are you know promoting prime and you paid some huge amounts of money to talk about it and pretend they use it he has even gone on record multiple times saying you know how he would never 
give this to his athletes ever and how it is overhyped um, nonsense for what it's, you know, supposedly intended for. But um, yeah, it's just interesting to know and hear you break it down. And it's actually not really that special in terms of its hydration abilities. Oh no, it's it, I would never give that to any single athlete. But you know, it, it probably it probably tastes great and they've probably you nailed the flavors. That. So if you guys don't know, that is the fight dietitian. He is the um, dietitian and weight cutting expert essentially who oversees Israel Adesanya and Volkanovski as they uh you know prepare for fights and a lot of other top tier athletes and you hear him say this this guy's just got to be a stupid virgin right like this guy doesn't know fucking anything you should post him on your story too Logan or any of these guys any of the other guys on YouTube that are uh you know seen as credible in the industry they must also just not know what they're talking about right if you're looking for an electrolyte or a hydration drink this isn't it. The only thing this drink is doing to you is giving you fluid. If you're looking to replace sweat in your body, you need something with more sodium, something that Prime does not deliver on. I feel like Logan at this point is just so mind warped to beef, internet drama. He just assumes anything about him that's negative that has to do with his brands or him at this point is, you know, clout chasing or he didn't do anything wrong. Like, I, I can't imagine that's not the case by his behavior. Like, the crypto zoo thing, too. The amount of stuff that the guy has jumped on the bandwagon of for a quick buck at the expense of his brand, potentially, is just mind-boggling to me. Like, the amount of years these guys put in to building up a name and then to put it on the line, even a little fucking bit, for a couple million bucks or whatever and some nonsense to try and take advantage of a chunk of their fans... It's fucking nonsensical to me. Like, I just don't understand where the uh, guidance is on his team. And then also to just ignore even the blatant, like, red, red flag scenarios. Like, CoffeeZilla put out how many viral videos before the guy even acknowledged his existence. And then also made a response video saying he would pay victims back 1.8 million bucks or whatever. I think the other... <laughs> I think the other day there was like a countdown timer too, or like a, a count up timer of how many days it's been since Logan promised to pay people back and still hasn't. Let me check Twitter. Hey, here we go. Live counter for how long it's taken for Logan Paul to repay his scam victims. It has been, let's see. I can't believe this domain wasn't taken. Logan Paul scams.com. <laughs> uh, it has been 226 days, 17 hours, 12 minutes, 40 seconds since Logan Paul promised to refund Crypto zoo victims he scammed. Has he repaid them? Find out. <laughs> I guess that's pretty clear. Uh, what is this? We are continually continuing to work hard to develop and release the game. This is a priority for me. <laughs> I've committed more than $1.8 million. Yeah, so, you know, not a priority. The guy jumps from project to project and, you know, he's lucky that Prime took off because some of the stuff was really just chipping away at his uh, at his brand, in my opinion. Now, who am I to say? Maybe I'm uh, <laughs> still blocked for this. You know, he's obviously a hyper successful guy, but it's just wild. Like, I was even talking to Coffee about this um, in private. The amount of stuff that this guy does that seemingly almost drowns out the negative. It's just like, <laughs> it's like the next viral thing to just drown out, you know, the next little negative scammy thing. It's just wild how he's managed to keep, to keep making it happen and pile on top of each other. You know, he has, gets exposed for scamming people, you know, choke slam some guy in the WWE <laughs> and gets enough views and comments to make up for it in spades and just, you know, replace all those fans that think he's shitty now with some new, you know, little kids or something. I think this must be why his fan base stays so young because it's like as people grow up and, you know, develop mature uh, brains and actually become fully grown adults, they realize that the guy is uh, quite loose on his uh, moral compass. And yeah, like why, why the fuck would you not have paid them back? Like this guy is out here on his most recent fight talking about how he's you know gonna bet conor mcgregor a million bucks on a whim he's like on his private jets conor you know what i'll tell you what all right i'll tell you what mr Moneybags. i'm gonna make this more interesting for you how about we double it two million two million dollars says i beat your boy dylan dennis i know you're gonna see this and yet he won't just go out and publicly say yeah i've paid back victims 1.8 million bucks like 
you must have hurt your brand more than $1.8 million worth at this point to it, not for it to make, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't fucking get it. So like make a fucking 60 second video and just, you know, make it happen, dude. Even for Prime, like, you know how easy it would be to get on video and just be like, yeah, I've seen some of the criticism online about the brand and about how, you know, we're not supposedly as great for hydration as we claim. Well, here's why. And here's the situations. Would it be good? Would it be great for? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not the traditional viral video, but it would shut a fuckload of people down from making videos anymore because you would actually say the use cases of it and stop misrepresenting the shit out of it like it's for you know, fighters for top tier athletes. Like there are a lot of people that are going to fuck up the rehydration protocols because of this guy's marketing specifically. Like even recently there was uh, him talking about Gatorade, talking about like, again, he compares himself to formulas all the time and it's, it's nonsensical. Like he purposefully ignores that there's direct comparable alternatives in the product lineup. Like for Gatorade, he made this post the other day. This 20 ounce bottle of Gatorade has 34 grams of sugar in it. One bottle of Prime has two grams of sugar. That's 17 times the amount of sugar. To help you visualize that, this is a 17X scale model of Prime. You would have to drink this entire giant bottle of Prime to consume the same sugar that's in this bottle of Gatorade. And honestly, I might, because it's the better for you option and it tastes delicious. Drink Prime. Like better for you option, based on what purpose though? Again, like to compare a solution intentionally filled with glucose that has alternatives that are superior to prime and to intentionally neglect to mention them when you know full well that they exist like where is your mention of g0 where is your comparison to that why do you keep comparing to the one designed for higher intensity and longer duration with glucose in it it's intentional mis intentionally misleading and that's the problem one of the biggest issues with this guy is he will not just mis misrepresent what his product is useful for but he will cherry pick <laughs> and compare to things that they would never even put themselves in the sphere of comparison for not only because they don't want to stoop down to his level so they're kind of fucked in that he just gets to talk about them and they can't really respond because then it looks like they care but he will take this spectrum and just ignore the shit out of it in order to uh profit off his own brand knowing full well this stuff exists like why not like go compare g0 to fucking prime bro please explain to me which is better for somebody who's actually sweating you know like please i would love to see it or even explain for somebody who's in a high intensity sport who is exercising for you know one to two plus hours like which one do you think is going to be better is it going to be this or is it going to be you know the 700 milligram potassium sucralose bomb with no sodium in it i don't know you tell me logan you fuck <laughs> it's just it's very frustrating one of the things that sucked to see too is they sponsor the ufc um big football clubs which i is okay i guess but when they imply like again israel adesanya volkanovsky getting sponsored too implying that there's some sort of actual utility among fighters who have to rehydrate aggressively after weight cutting aggressively like shit can get dangerous if somebody is misled into thinking this is the strategy and this tweet pissed me off a bit this was Sugar Sean weighing in, looking depleted as fuck. Has a Prime, you know, stand in front of him because they're sponsoring the UFC. Drink Prime says rehydration time, fire emoji, as if implying that now it's time to drink Prime. Because again, you're the title sponsor, like the, the hydration beverage of the entire league. You would think rehydration time means like, okay, let's, you know, chug some Prime or something. No, no, no. That's the fucking, <laughs> that is not what this guy wants to be doing. And I promise you he didn't. And I promise you, Adesanya is never going to be seen slamming primes, you know, after weight cutting. He's going to be using what, you know, the fight dietitian has laid out for him. None of these guys are actually drinking the shit for the purpose in which Logan purports it's uh, so amazing, which is the uh, one of the most frustrating, you know, things about it. So anyways, getting back to Ethan, interesting scenario. This is a guy who, um, a young kid who basically has symptoms of dehydration despite supposedly drinking, you know, plenty of liquids per day. So firstly, we don't actually know what, you know, plenty of liquids means. A lot of people say they eat in a calorie deficit and they're, you know, gaining weight when they're actually eating in a surplus and they don't count the 
you know, salad dressing they're drenching their salads in or what have you, or the liquid, you know, drinks that they're getting extra calories from and all this stuff. You know, the same can be said for what is a lot is very, very subjective. So we don't know what plenty actually means. In addition, we don't actually see the test results that this doctor supposedly ran. Like it says, there was basic tests run, the doctor made some tweaks. A lot of doctors aren't really taught to handle nutrition. They are taught a myriad of different things, but, um, you know, it's not their fault necessarily, but it's just not a big intensive part of their education process to make sure they understand rigorously how electrolyte balance works, as far as I know. So, you know, getting a second opinion definitely would have been a good idea and getting, you know, somebody to look at the blood work and seeing what is awry because to me, if there is, you know, some sort of indication, if this if this kid is at the point where he is, you know, perpetually having headaches and whatnot, there is a significant amount of uh, imbalance going on. I feel like this is a good graphical representation of hypertonic dehydration and what circumstances could possibly lead to the outcomes, uh, you know, being stated here. So in the case of hypertonic dehydration, um, we'll get into the other types of dehydration soon, but and examples, but for this case, I feel it's worth diving into this one specifically first in a bit more detail because I speculate um, there to be overlap with the described outcomes. Because, you know, this kid, he had, you know, feels better almost immediately drinking liquids that are almost entirely sodium free and are super high in potassium and a good amount of magnesium. Like to me, that indicates that there is probably a situation, when there's symptoms of dehydration too concurrently, there is probably water loss exceeding sodium loss. Because again, it's not like this kid is ingesting sodium, he is actually diluting his blood further when he's drinking more water free of sodium. So by that token, you would, you know, it's fair to infer and ex extrapolate out and assume there is probably a higher serum sodium concentration proportionally than may otherwise be ideal. And this is where you would see, I would think, in the blood test, if he had one done that was elaborate enough, um, a serum sodium level that is high and osmolality would be elevated, which is the concentration of all particles dissolved in the bodily fluid assessed in this, you know, lab analysis, whatever they had done, presumably a blood test. So to me, my speculative guesses, you know, off the bat is as far as like practical takeaways, probably doesn't drink enough water despite the claim that he drinks plenty of water. I'm assuming because prime tastes like literal liquid sugar, it's easier to consume for kids who, you know, really like the taste of it than just plain water. Some people are just not gonna like the taste of plain water. They wanna put something in it. Something that tastes like, you know, goddamn candy is probably gonna be easier to drink for some kids. So he's getting more fluid than he would in general otherwise. That is my first assumption. And the main ingredient in prime after all is water. A lot of people don't realize, like these drinks, these RTDs, it's water with a bunch of stuff in it or lack of stuff, depending, but like it's the main ingredient is still water. It's still like the, the fluid is hydrating. Also, he could be potassium or magnesium deficient or both. Like to me, those are pretty reasonable outcomes as well, given that the kid perked up seemingly pretty quickly after ingestion of a, you know, 700 milligram per liter um, solution. I actually don't even think it's per liter. Now that, let me go look at the concentration, it is 500 milliliters, sorry, 700 milligrams per half liter. That's a lot. So yeah, you know, potassium deficiency and, or an imbalance, again, this sort of reinforces the sodium, you know, disproportionate uh, concentrations relative to hydration status and, you know, potassium and magnesium levels. To me, that further reinforces that, you know, potential. In addition to that, his diet is disproportionately skewed towards sodium relative to his water, potassium, magnesium intake. This is very common. A lot of standard Western American diets are very, very high in sodium and proportionally, not just proportionally low in potassium, but also deficient entirely based on RDAs. And then in addition to that, magnesium deficiency is so common like even people who are oftentimes people who are even relatively health conscious are pretty are off on potassium and magnesium or at least one of the two in addition could be a genetic predisposition we don't know what his genetics are like or what individual unique circumstances 
are imposed upon him for his mineral needs, but there are an array of things that could contribute, such as you know kidney disease, post-obstructive diuresis, salt wasting, tubular disease, Addison disease, hyper hypoaldosteronism, hyperglycemia, diabetes, insipidus. And there are certain things that are going to make it more dysfunctional for your body to regulate fluids. Um, and cell hydration and whatnot. And it goes above and beyond just, you know, how much you're sweating and what your diet is. Like there are certain things that may overly complicate it even more. We also don't know, you know, what are his bowel movements like? Is he literally shitting water all the time? Like, I don't know. Like, there's so much stuff we could go into this that we don't really know. But at the end of the day, what you need to know about this type of dehydration is literally like pulling hydration out of cells because of the disproportionate or lack of fluid. And like there's, you know, this laundry list of causes we could just go through again, and it'd be the same thing. But I did, I imagine there was some overlap of the things I mentioned, a combination of them, or, you know, pot potentially none, but I think these are fair guesses. Either way, his blood work and urine analysis should be revealing of that if he's literally to the point of extreme symptoms where he's chronically feeling dehydrated, headaches, you know, fatigue, etc. This should reveal itself in comprehensive enough blood work and urine analysis and hopefully his doctor arranged that for him, but I'm doubtful it was comprehensive. Like I have had some piss poor, you know, support from my family doctor before when it came to being proactive, you know, as a even, you know, a young adult trying to check their lipids, for example, to be proactive against, you know, atherosclerosis development. Good fucking luck, at least in Canada. It's a gong show trying to do that. So I think there's something wrong. And I think that they should get a more comprehensive panel. And I would be happy to pay for it myself. We can coordinate that through Merrick Health. Just reach out to, you know, if the parents who sent Logan's team an email want to reach out to my team. Happy to pay for a fully comprehensive blood panel and urine analysis and see if we can identify what the root of the issue is because if there is some you know like underlying diabetes or hyperglycemia or kidney disease or something that is genetic in nature to some extent this is not something you just want to mask with you know slamming primes all the time just put it that way and it's great if you found something that helps absolutely you know by all means use it but it is not typical for somebody or I would say reasonable for somebody to be sustaining themselves on sucralose dense potassium, obscenely concentrated water. Like that is not a typical thing you would expect for a healthy functioning child. So there's gotta be something else at play or this kid just, you know, acts like he drinks water and just never does, or I don't know, like there must be something going on here. So, and my, you know, my speculated assumptions could be way off and this is where getting blood work uh, urine analysis and a high quality doctor on your side to analyze it all would be worthwhile. And again, like my team at Merrick, I would be happy to link them up with a doctor who is more than qualified to actually interpret the results too. I wouldn't be the one looking at it. So anyways, again, the issue isn't with the product itself necessarily. Like as much as people shit on Prime, we say it's terrible for hydration, blah, blah, blah. It is not necessarily the product because again, this kid if he actually is that potassium deficient and won't drink fluid unless it tastes amazing or whatever, like that is a blatant use case for where it may be. Like that's where supplementation could be super valuable. However, it is the <laughs> relentless misrepresented marketing, the tit for tat videos where he goes against liquid IV, um, Gatorade. Um, how many other companies has he done at this point? Several. And, you know, claiming that they are the you know, the tailored for actual hydration, better for you product, the other products are inferior, we're better, we're edging them out, et cetera, et cetera. It's just constant BS spewed from this guy's mouth all the fucking time. And the fact that it's marketed through the top athletes on the planet now too, and there's being subtly implying that they actually use it <laughs> for performance. And it's like the premier sponsor of like a, a football club or something, or UFC where people, like it's just wild the sports in particular that are it's being sponsored is it's sponsoring it's like these are the last places you would want to drink something like this and again there's nothing necessarily wrong with that it is just the marketing so let's get into hydration and exactly you know what it is 
how to identify dehydration, what kind of formulas are good and bad and why. And yeah, I think this will be very insightful, hopefully, and help elucidate some truths about electrolyte formulas in this industry, when they're useful, when it's just overhyped nonsense, like Logan likes to put out. Like again, please don't have a fighter cut weight and then give him fucking potassium water with no glucose or anything. Like that's just dangerous stuff to have a fucking tweet out there that's showing Sean and has a caption rehydration time. Maybe I'm taking it too seriously, but I'm, and people just aren't going to, you know, read between the lines, but I mean, fuck, you never know, man. So anyway, humans are made of approximately 60% water. You know, there are a lot of numbers thrown out all the time, but that's a ballpark that's reasonably accurate and good enough for the purposes of illustration. So water is inside of cells and outside of cells. This is intracellular fluid, and this accounts for about two thirds of whole body water. And then out of cells, extracellular fluid is the other one third of whole body water. And this includes uh, blood, makes up about one quarter of the extracellular fluid. Like when you see your serum electrolyte levels on a blood test, that is not reflective of cell saturation and systemic you know, concentrations as a whole in your whole body. That is just what is in your blood at that snapshot in time. So I think first and foremost, it's worth discussing how water actually gets absorbed because um, a lot of people, they think if you drink, you know, a Gatorade, oh, that's an electrolyte formula and a sugar, it's great, it's better for delivery. Or you drink a Prime, it's sugar-free, but it also hydrates you, great, it's just not as much energy. Like, there are very common uh, myths that are perpetuated by people who don't, you know, explain the products thoroughly, like Logan, which... If we can thank Prime and Logan for anything, it is highlighting the importance of understanding electrolyte concentrations and the importance of sodium in particular, because a lot of people have probably educated themselves a lot more based on the fact that uh, he has clearly not gone in prepared to make some of these bold claims that he has. And as a result, people want to understand it better and don't want to be misled. So, you know, when you drink water, it doesn't get just instantly absorbed into cells. In fact, some solutions sold on the market, very popular ones at that, can be paradoxically dehydrating to cells. So that hypertonic dehydration scenario I showed you earlier, in the presence of a concentrated enough solution, you could actually have the body pulling hydration out of cells in order to dilute the solution in the intestines because of its tonicity. So tonicity is largely what is going to regulate fluid dynamics in the body and where, where water goes. So if you have, you know, we'll get into the most extreme examples soon, but basically what you need to understand first is absorption of water is through osmosis. And this is where water diffuses in response to an osmotic gradient that is going to be dictated primarily by electrolytes, you know, sodium being the uh, sodium chloride being the primary one of those. So when you drink water, it's absorbed into the intestines and enters your bloodstream through tiny vessels. It does not go straight into cells. Rather, it has to make its way into extracellular fluid and then also wake it, make its way into the cells intracellularly from there. It moves into spaces around cells and can move in and out of cells. And this is all going to be dictated mainly by differences in tonicity in solutions. I think overall, a lot of people are familiar with symptoms of dehydration, which we can get into shortly, just a hit list of them. But just, you know, it's one of the biggest detriments to performance is when you are um, dehydrated, it's uh, brutal. 2%, you know, loss in whole body water, I believe leads to like a 20% decrease in performance or something dramatic like that. And obviously there's a spectrum where it's not like, once you've lost 2% equals this much loss in performance, like dehydration at any level is going to be problematic and not have optimal outcomes. It's not, it's not just like you hit this threshold and now your performance is down. There's a spectrum of which deterioration of performance is going to happen anywhere below, you know, ideal. The so next, I think it would be best to talk about sweat and what, what is it? Why do you sweat? Um, what is it comprised of? Cause this is largely going to dictate if you replace fluid in general, if that fluid should also have electrolytes present. And if so, in what proportions should you have glucose present? What situations actually warrant supplementation, peri-workout and why? 
and actually understanding because there was a lot of ambiguity in this industry and a lot of misleading marketing that would lead you to believe that you should be sipping on, you know, these fucking things all day long. And by the way, I have this just for the video, but because um, I'm going to do a little comparison later <laughs> in another video. But, you know, people leading you to believe you need to be sipping on these things for adequate health when in reality, like the justification of implementation needs to be context specific and you have to know why you're doing it. And also there's like countless amounts of formulas on the market, understanding which one is actually applicable to you and why for your individual, you know, saltiness of your sweat as well as your sweat rate for your individual activities, how intensive it is, temperature outside, your tolerance of that temperature. It's all individually variable. So this is where you have to understand what it is and why to begin with. So first off, the average athlete loses one to three liters of sweat per hour, which is quite a bit. Obviously, this will vary depending on temperature and whatnot. It could be the low end of that, if not less, or the high end of that, if not more, depends. But in general, like what, why would you sweat that much? It is the body's natural cooling mechanism to regulate temperature and maintain a healthy internal balance. So it's going to consist of water and electrolytes primarily. So, and other compounds actually too, which we'll get into later, which often go very overlooked and can actually lead to some pretty uh, glaring deficiencies that impact metabolic function fairly significantly, I would say. But sweat is produced by the sweat glands, you know, in response to physical activity, heat, stress in some cases too. Sweat is primarily, primarily made up of water as well as sodium and chloride being, you know, the lion's share of what electrolytes are concentrated in sweat that is being sweat out, excreted out of the body. And then to a much lesser extent, potassium. And then to a much lesser extent than that, uh, magnesium and calcium in not trace amounts, but it kind of depends on the person. And then there's other things that are like negligibly sweat out, but depends on the person, you know, phosphorus and, you know, trace elements that we'll get into later. That gets a bit more granular on things, but are important in my opinion to highlight too. So consequences of dehydration, as you would imagine, decreased strength, consequence of dehydration, impaired thermoregulation. You fatigue so much easier when your body is not able to thermoregulate properly. Increased heart rate um, in order to maintain blood circulation, which creates a higher perceived effort during exercise. And on the thermoregulation thing, like overheating, heat exhaustion, like there are so many things that I'm just rifling off things that can happen as like overarching statements, but there are like sub tiers of different outcomes that can be problematic underneath these too, you know, even from a muscle glycogen loss standpoint and the impact that's going to have on muscular fullness cosmetically. But in addition to that, strength in the gym, how sodium interplays with uh, uh, glucose in the body, you are never going to get a good pump when you are, or at least it's much more difficult when you are electrolyte depleted or dehydrated or totally deficient in, you know, your glycogen stores are completely depleted too. There's a reason why if you go on a keto diet, all of a sudden it's like, oh damn, I lost you know five to 10 pounds in a couple of weeks. It's like, no, a lot of that is just you pissing out water. It's a lot harder to uh, maintain adequate sodium retention when you are on a keto diet, for example. So anyways, you know, decreased strength I mentioned, impaired thermal regulation, increased heart rate, muscle cramps, probably the most familiar side effect of dehydration, fatigue and weakness, um, decreased cognitive function, big one, Increased risk of injuries, not something you want to deal with, and delayed recovery. And there are a host of others, but those are just a laundry list of things that could go wrong and will go wrong in a state of dehydration. So not only are adequate concentrations of electrolytes necessary to regulate processes in the body, but the proper ratios of them as well. And this is where things get really, really murky in the dietary supplement industry, as there are plenty of formulas that exist that don't have any scientific evidence reinforcing their efficacy, but there are actually a fair bit that may otherwise be either unnecessary or even impairing performance in certain contexts as well. Because remember, I mentioned briefly, you can pull hydration out of cells through the tonicity of the solution you are ingesting. So if you are having you know, the most glucose dense bomb of a drink ever, and you are trying to rehydrate quick, you may otherwise be screwing yourself a little bit and pulling hydration out in order to dilute that solution in the intestine and actually make it, you know, more tolerable 
and absorbable and actually balance out those uh, concentrations in the body where there's trying to maintain a homeostasis of tonicity. Because again, isotonic solutions are always going to be what maintain fluid dynamics throughout cells, intracellularly, extracellularly. And if you have something that's just extreme hypertonic, it is going to be dehydrating regardless if you have, you know, a shitload of, you know, electrolytes in it or whatever. And again, because it's like water and electrolytes, not exactly the same thing. We'll get into the difference between hydration, dehydration, and volume loss shortly too, because that is a big distinction that I see conflated often. An example of formulas doing the opposite of intended purpose. So one example, potassium inhibits sodium reabsorption by the kidney. Whereas a low potassium diet actually enhances renal sodium reabsorption. So you can see where not just the actual sodium concentration that you have, as well as that you ingest in your diet, whatever. But in addition to that, the ratio of counterbalancing to some extent, potassium and other electrolytes can regulate how impactful the sodium, like what it does from a negative or positive context on your body, you may otherwise have multiple things go awry because of a lack of proportional balance, not just the sheer totality of the milligram concentrations, but it is the deficit of the other stuff to not counterbalance it because having everything in harmony is important for optimal function and health at the end of the day. There's a reason why you know blood pressure will go up in the absence of sufficient potassium, even with the same sodium ingestion. So if you're sweating a lot, for example, meaning um, majority of that being water, sodium, and chloride, you can see where rehydrating with straight water or, you know, well, I'll get into how this dilution would happen, but basically if you're drinking straight water, which a lot of people will be doing, or water plus high concentrations of potassium, AKA prime, you might be increasing blood volume, but you are also potentially exacerbating a sodium dilution, which depending on how much sodium you had at baseline, and what your, you know, the tonicity of your blood was, it, uh, yeah, it depends how problematic that's going to be for the duration of whatever exercise session you're doing, how much you're sweating, etc. But you could get to a point of, you know, diluting yourself into, you know, hyponatremia by this is this happens sometimes like a few times a year somebody will literally kill themselves in a marathon or something by exercising for you know multiple hours under super hot conditions and then after losing a lot of water, they rehydrate with, you know, straight water. And you would think, okay, if I am sweating a lot, I need to drink water to replace the sweat, but they're taking in all this water and constantly diluting their blood further without replacing the electrolytes that are necessary for fluid balance in and out of cells at the same time. So that's where you can get into hyponatremia territory. And that is basically a low proportional, like, you know, sodium losses are exceeding uh, fluid losses. So you are not actually making up ground on the electrolytes lost. You're simply rehydrating with fluids and diluting your plasma more. So the heat isn't necessary, by the way, to get hyponatremia, but it does exacerbate the need for you to drink fluid. And that's where you can get into trouble. If you're really, really thirsty and you're drinking fluid and you're not taking the electrolytes with it, it can be problematic. It's rare though, you know, low sodium in the blood hyponatremia. Most people are, have more than enough sodium in their diet and they could actually use some dilution realistically. But for athletes, this gets different. Diluting your electrolytes by, you know, cranking high amounts of straight water without electrolytes peri-workout, which is the pre-intra-post workout, you know, window, or even doing everyday activities in high heat, you know, if you're working outside, what have you. When you're sweating a lot, you will never be in an optimal state for performance if you are just slamming, you know, like prime potassium with water, unless you start it off at a baseline state of sodium excess, realistically because you are going to be sweating out a high amount of sodium with your sweat, unless you're like some genetically, <laughs> you barely sweat sodium, you might be on the low end of the spectrum, but it's still, you are surely losing some that is more significant than the other electrolytes lost. And if you're rehydrating with just primes or just straight water, if you're sweating a shit ton, um, it can get problematic. Um, and again, like you don't need to get into danger health zone territories where you might die to have a deterioration in performance to some actual, you know, significant enough degree for you to care. So this is where, you know, 
while it's rare to literally like pass out from dehydration because of, you know, fill in the blank reason, dilution, what have you, you don't want to even get into a 1% of deterioration performance scenario because you didn't optimize your protocol, priming yourself as you went into the activity, etc. So your body's pretty good at self-regulating, fortunately. And in cases of mild dehydration, like you know, zero to one hours of activity in reasonable temperatures, even if moderate, even a moderate intensity, straight water is probably going to be fine. Like you don't need to be super anal about your electrolyte intake. If you went into a session with good hydration, nutrition at baseline, like the likelihood you're going to need to drink some sort of electrolyte solution that's finely tuned for you on like a, you know, a one hour lifting session, super unlikely, but it gets too impactful to ignore at, you know, higher intensity levels longer durations, like one to two plus hours. Those who are keto dieting, like I mentioned, people who are fasting, some attention should be paid, I think, to the balance of electrolytes in general, even if you don't sweat, because a lot of people are, again, like I mentioned, potassium and magnesium deficient, and their diets are super heavy on sodium. So one thing that should be noted with this whole, you know, highlighting the importance of sodium and electrolyte formulas, et cetera, et cetera, most people who aren't athletes consume enough sodium in their diet but most are still potassium and magnesium deficient, as I mentioned. This isn't always the case, but it's common. However, this gets thrown awry in the context of sports performance. High intensity exercise, diet type, carb intake, exposure to high temperatures with high levels of sweating, and people often talk about mineral deficiencies and blame, you know, lack of electrolytes, et cetera, et cetera. But often overlooked is the discussion of how much water somebody is drinking. Like everyone talks about, oh, you know, the sodium concentration of this, the potassium proportions of this, and I talk about it a lot too, but a lot are blaming their issues on electrolyte formula, you know, necessities or not enough of a certain mineral in their diet, which, you know, may be the case too, but a lot of people aren't drinking enough water as well, which we'll get into what baseline hydration looks like um, later, like how much water you should be drinking per day, as well as around your workout perimeter peri workout, but just defining hydration and dehydration, this often gets conflated too, because some people say I'm dehydrated or, you know, this situation leads to dehydration or what have you, but there is a difference between volume loss and hydration versus dehydration. We'll get into where the confusion comes from and hopefully it helps frame out the conversation. So dehydration can be classified into different types based on the relative concentration of electrolytes in the body compared to bodily fluids. So here are the main causes of hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic dehydration. We went into hypertonic earlier, but we will get into the other two now. So first up, we have hypotonic dehydration, also known as hyponatremia, a term that uh, probably a more common term that people are familiar with, but it occurs when there is a loss of sodium that exceeds the loss of water. So this leads to a decreased concentration of sodium in the blood, and can lead to essentially severe electrolyte dilution if you are rehydrating with, you know, aggressive amounts of straight water or straight water with just a shit ton of potassium, like a prime. <laughs> and it, in the context of sweating a lot and, you know, in high temperatures and what have you, and this is, you know, where people get into danger zone territory in three, four, five plus hour endurance events in high temperatures where they're rehydrating with just straight water, they are just further diluting their blood and becoming electrolyte deficient proportionally, and it's dangerous. So this is where, you know, attention should be paid to, you know, the importance of electrolyte replenishment, but also just knowing that your sweat in itself is a hypotonic solution kind of helps illustrate what needs to be done when it comes to rehydration, in my opinion. Like the Again, I don't want to overlook the fact that most people just need to drink more water too when I'm saying all this. Because again, while you could be getting to a state of hyponatremia through aggressive rehydration with just straight water, when your sweat is comprised a lot of you know sodium chloride, by that same token, a lot of people just need to drink more water too. So keep in mind that the actual fluid being lost when you are sweating is hypotonic in that there is still a lot of water loss that needs to be replaced as a priority too. It's not just about getting your sodium back in or whatnot. So, you know, don't rehydrate with just water and potassium water 
unless you are starting from a state of sodium excess to begin with, to some extent, and you have some leniency there, or you're just not sweating a whole lot to begin with, or you're like a super low salt sweater and can get away with it, your leniency and flexibility in this will vary. But overall, what you need to know is hypotonic dehydration is when your loss of sodium exceeds the loss of fluid. Another common scenario, by the way, forgot to mention, diuretic use. This is where you inhibit the reabsorption of sodium with a drug, therefore disproportionately decreasing sodium concentrations relative to water. So this is bodybuilders can get into danger zone territory with this, oftentimes combining multiple diuretics, not understanding their mechanism of action, depleting the shit out of themselves of water and sodium and trying to like reload it last minute and just kind of like trying to eke out another, you know, five to 10% in cosmetic fullness by perfecting their peak week, but just not understanding fluid dynamics and how this stuff works. It's uh, sketchy stuff when you are super dehydrated and adding in things that are inhibiting the absorption of electrolytes into the body. So yeah, diuretic use is probably the primary cause of hypotonic dehydration, I, I suppose, outside of like people drinking straight water and like extreme endurance events, which isn't common. I think most people know not to do that, but still happens, you know, a few times a year, it seems. Next up, we have isotonic dehydration. So this is when both water and electrolytes are lost together, maintaining the overall balance of concentration. The most common types of isotonic dehydration are still going to be through, you know, excessive sweating, through temperature exposure, exercise, um, because it leads to both loss of water and electrolytes, but this would be through, you know, it's mostly the rehydration strategies that often are going to dictate when you get into a state of excess or deficiency, at least in the dilution aspect, because you're otherwise going to lose. It's not necessarily proportionally because you're losing hypotonic solution when you sweat, but in isotonic dehydration, you are losing both you know, it's essentially a loss of volume overall. That is the main thing you have to take away from it. Um, other causes include, besides, you know, excessive sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, burns, intrinsic kidney disease, hyperglycemia, and hypoaldosteronism. Like there is overlap with some of these and you can get finicky because again, some of these could also apply for hypertonic dehydration, depending on how low the electrolyte concentrations are of the fluid lost via that you know, elimination method, but most people losing fluid are losing more water proportionally than electrolytes and their fluids are hypotonic with few exceptions like diuretic use. So it's of note though, that in general, in like medical settings, when rehydration is attempted, it is typically with a, you know, isotonic infusion of like physiologic saline, which we'll get to shortly as well. But again, understanding the delineation between these is important, I think, for realizing when, at least when dehydration is caused by lack of water or lack of electrolytes. So next up, hypertonic dehydration. We went over the visual representation of this earlier, but this is, you know, the last piece of this puzzle on this summary right here. Hypertonic dehydration is also known as hypernatremia. So think the opposite of hyponatremia where you have um, a loss of sodium that is exceeding fluid loss. In this case, you would have a loss of water that is greater than the electrolyte loss, sodium primarily. It is sodium that is being referred to. So this leads to an increased concentration of electrolytes in the blood, particularly sodium. And it can be caused by an array of things. But in general, this one is going to be like no rehydration strategies that are proportionally diluting because it's the opposite. This is where you are actually losing more water than electrolytes. So it is straight up like your sweat. If you just sweat yourself into oblivion <laughs> through temperature exposure, exercise, whatever, this is where you can get into hypertonic dehydration in general, because this is going to be, you're going to lose a lot of both electrolytes and fluid, but depending on how salty of a sweater you are versus not, again, it is a hypotonic solution you are sweating and eventually you're going to get to a point where your fluids are just so low that you have a proportionally higher amount of sodium in the blood than you should despite the fact that actual plasma volume is too low to begin with too also insufficient water intake so not drinking enough fluids to replace those lost through sweat urine bodily functions etc this is what i suspect one of the main causes of uh 
I think it was Ethan, I forget his name earlier. Uh, let me double check that. Ethan, I suspect one of the main causes, you know, could be. Also, diabetes insipidus, a condition that affects the body's ability to regulate water balance due to a lack of antidiuretic hormone. If you have this, you know, you could have perfect dialed in nutrition, hydration practices that are thrown amok or awry because you have something like this that needs to be identified and addressed accordingly. Vomiting and diarrhea, gastrointestinal illnesses result in vomiting and diarrhea can cause a loss of water and electrolytes, but you know, proportionally, typically people are going to be losing more water than electrolytes and this can cause a like anti-dilution of electrolytes via you know, it's overall plasma volume lost, but still you were going to have a higher residual amount of electrolytes relative to the amount of fluid and you need both, but that's where you get into hypertonic dehydration territory potentially. Last example, this is probably the best one. I probably should have started with this. Maybe should have only said this, but seawater. I feel like this is the most polar extreme to exemplify hypertonic dehydration. I probably should have mentioned it earlier in the uh, discussion about uh, Ethan too for like an extreme. But this is the opposite of, if you think hyponatremia and, you know, diluting the hell out of your electrolytes because of excessive straight water ingestion when you're sweating a lot in high temperature for long durations of activity, this is the complete opposite where you are introducing something with such a high tonicity relative to the extracellular fluid in your body and cells that you are actually pulling hydration into the intestines in order to balance it out. So seawater, the reason you're warned to not drink it and don't drink it is the sodium chloride concentration is immense. So the tonicity is so much greater than what is in cells. It creates an osmotic imbalance between the water in your body cells and the salt water. So water will actually be pulled out of cells even though you are drinking salt water or I keep calling it salt water, seawater. When you are drinking seawater, it is so dense in sodium chloride that it is going to pull hydration out of the body, out of cells, out of extracellular fluid in order to dilute this absurdly salty solution that you've ingested, that it decreases your overall body water content, leading to dehydration so paradoxically, because it's like, okay, well, I'm drinking water, a shit ton of it potentially, and salt, you would think this is like hydrating, you know, getting your electrolytes up at the, you know, extreme. No, this actually dehydrates the hell out of you more than anything. That's the crazy thing. So the more salt water you drink, the more water your body loses. Did I say salt water again? Seawater, bro. Seawater. This dehydration can lead to serious health issues as, you've, as you'd imagine. So for context, just how concentrated seawater is compared to blood. This is really interesting. And compared to electrolyte formulas, in seawater, there is typically close to, what's your guess? How many, how many thousand milligrams? Like if you have a, you know, an electrolyte solution that is, you know, 500 to 1,000 per liter on the market, that's, you would probably consider that like a pretty salty solution, right? Now, for context, the human body has about 9,000 milligrams of sodium chloride in every liter of fluid. And this, again, this is why isotonic IV fluids are typically 0.9% sodium chloride, which is nine milligrams per milliliter, 9,000 milligrams per liter, because you want it to balance out uh, fluid in and out of cells perfectly, ideally. And we'll get into some nuance with that, but so we have like electrolyte solutions that you're ingesting orally that could be, you know, 1,000 milligrams per liter, hypotonic relative to a 9,000 milligram per liter blood, seawater is close to typically 35,000 milligrams of dissolved salts in each liter of fluid. So imagine that you are drinking, even if it's water, the amount of hydration you have to pull out of the body in order to dilute that 35,000 milligram per liter solution, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. So yeah, never drink seawater. It will uh, fuck you up. <laughs> So, and getting back to the uh, physiologic IV, by the way, if you infuse straight water into your bloodstream, cells would absorb way too much, you know, hydration. They become overhydrated and they would actually rupture. And if you infused a hypertonic solution into someone, you know, similar to the seawater example I just gave, 
you would dehydrate cells. So this is where, like in a medical setting, they have to be very careful about the tonicity of the fluids they are infusing into somebody to rehydrate or maintain hydration. And little proportional tweaks can be made depending on if they need to actually dehydrate an area. Like for example, if you had like brain swelling after a head injury, that's where seemingly hypertonic, slightly hypertonic solutions might be applied in a medical setting. But in general, they are using a 0.9% sodium chloride isotonic solution IV to ensure balance in cells is maintained along with hydration. So it's important to note that the terms hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic refer to relative concentration of electrolytes in body compared to bodily fluid. So the underlying causes of these types of dehydration can vary wildly depending on the person, different individual factors, you know, activity levels, environmental conditions, health status, genetics, fluid intake, electrolyte intake. But, you know, if you're a high level athlete, you know, you're committed to optimizing your protocols. It's, it's worth understanding how this works. And, you know, the main thing, like, again, I want to highlight is water loss from sweat is mainly water and meaning it is hypotonic and has a lower concentration of solutes compared to what is in the extracellular fluid of the human body. Meaning if you want to rehydrate fast with fluid, the ideal way to do that would be to ingest something that is also hypotonic in order to absorb fluid quicker. So, but again, your strategy will depend on what the priority is right now. Is it quick energy? Is it quick hydration? Is it the sustaining of hydro? Like, what is it? So also another thing that gets conflated, the proportion of electrolytes in sweat from exercise versus heat. So some people are in, you know, hot yoga sessions or sauna or whatever, and they're sweating or just high temperatures outside and they're sweating a lot. But does that differ significantly from activity induced sweating um, or a combination thereof? This is something I was actually interested in myself and wanted to find out. And it seems to be the case that there is not a significant difference. So this was a study, sweat composition and exercising in heat. So what they found in this was that sauna bathing compared to exercise, the sweat from those two things did not yield a significantly different um, outcome of proportions of sodium, potassium, and chloride loss. So to me, that is like, these are the most abundantly present electrolytes that need to have the most attention paid to them when it comes to replenishment and balance around peri-workout. So these being in like non-distinguishable variability in terms of proportion lost, regardless if you're exercising or just like in high heat, to me, that is, uh, gives peace of mind for rehydration strategy or hydration strategy in general because it doesn't get more complicated you know it's already complicated enough with this stuff having to worry about if it's going to be different based upon what i'm doing and then you know tweaking electrolyte formulas or lack thereof based on that not something i want to think about i just want to think about how much i'm sweating per hour how much electrolytes i might be losing out of that and fluid i'm losing and replacing that accordingly to maintain my body weight. So now getting into the type of solution to deploy in each scenario. This is where we get into not the dehydration types, but the types of solutions and when to apply them accordingly. And this is how you actually identify what electrolyte formula is best for me and why, and what is a shitty one that is being you know misrepresented to me. This graphic is an illustration showing how cells respond to hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic oral electrolyte solutions commonly sold on the market. So delineating between what these are and what applications contextually they are most relevant for and useful for. Hypotonic solution is a solution that has a tonicity that is lower than that of the extracellular fluid, meaning it is going to be more rapidly absorbed and you can hydrate cells at a more efficient pace. Isotonic is a equivalent tonicity, tonicity to the extracellular fluid and would result in a essentially net neutral outcome when it comes to cell 
hydration, dehydration, like you're not gonna have any differentiation in terms of how it is volumizing or drawing in and out of cells because the percentage concentration should be equivalent to that already present in the body. And when I say comparable, like identical, it's literally the representation of like physiologic concentrations of a like saline IV solution that is used for replicating what you find in your blood. It's like the 0.9% sodium chloride concentration that's IV'd is otherwise seen as like the isotonic benchmark. So in an oral hydration solution, matching that tonicity would otherwise be, or, you know, depending on what the person's electrolyte concentrations and hydration status and plasma volume are like, it could, you know, differ depending on what the concentration is, if it's still isotonic or not. But ultimately what you need to know is it is like a neutral in terms of its tonicity being equal to that of extracellular fluid. And then we have hypertonic, which is a higher tonicity than that of the extracellular fluid, blood. And this is where you get into, you know, cell dehydration territory potentially, where there's such a high concentration of sodium chloride primarily, but glucose, other things that can contribute to a dehydrating effect. And again, the question then, you know, often will come up, well, when would you use this? That is where there is unique applications depending on the situation and needs of the person. So, and this is where it's not one size fits all. So let's get into it. First is hypotonic, best used for rapid rehydration. So hypotonic solutions are often recommended for rapid rehydration because they have a lower concentration of electrolytes than bodily fluids. So this can encourage the movement of water in and out of cells very quickly, which is more beneficial in cases of mild dehydration or when quick hydration is needed. For example, after a moderate workout, a hypotonic solution may be effective in restoring fluid balance. You're not gonna have massive glycogen depletion. You're not um, subjecting yourself to long durations of intense activity. The probability that you need to replace aggressive amounts of electrolytes and or aggressive amounts of glucose is unlikely. And this is where you can get away with almost no tonicity with straight water. If you have a, you know, zero to one hour training session and you went in hydrated, well fed, and you didn't sweat excessively and there, you know, it wasn't continuous super high effort with super high temperatures, you can probably get away with the lowest of low in tonicity. But as you start to scale up in sweat rate, if you're a salty sweater, intensity of activity, duration, etc., that is where a hypotonic solution with some electrolytes present can be quite useful for not only getting water into cells quickly, but not having a concentration so high that you are inhibiting the efficiency of fluid transit, essentially. Next up is an isotonic solution. So this is matching the tonicity of the extracellular fluid and leads to a neutral exchange, essentially, of hydration. So the amount of water transported into the cell is equal to the amount of water transported out of the cell because solute concentrations inside the cell equal the solution outside of the cell and equals the tonicity of what you are ingesting. So you're not going to be pulling water out of the body into the intestine to, you know, dilute the solution because you, you know, drank something that is way, way, way too salty or way heavy on glucose. An isotonic solution is typically used in a medical context, you know, the IV saline solution to restore fluid and electrolyte balance concurrently. It's also used in physical activity and exercise scenario, but notably, this is highly dependent on your electrolyte concentrations relative to hydration status through fluid, because if you are losing a certain amount of fluid and there is a certain amount of sweat and potassium and magnesium, et cetera, in that sweat, if you are going into a workout, you know, fully hydrated, well-fed, glycogen stores topped out, in which scenario would you be depleting yourself so significantly that you would need to lean to a more highly concentrated solution that may otherwise slightly impair the 
rapid and ef most efficient movement of water, that's where it gets a bit more nuanced and it is more so on the spectrum of intensity of activity and temperature exposure, tolerability of that temperature exposure and exercise duration and intensity because tonicity can also elevate because of glucose inclusion. And if you are, you know, needing to lean to a, you know, liquid IV type solution, as opposed to like an element or something that has some glucose in it, but is still not like obscenely high in electrolytes. Because again, remember physiologic saline is like nine grams per liter or something. So getting closer to isotonic kind of makes more sense when you are heavily electrolyte depleted and or need to push some rapidly assimilating glucose that you can top up your glycogen stores or offset the uh, um, deterioration of them essentially. So it is more on a demand basis. And in general, an isotonic solution would not be something you really need to lean into until you get to two plus hours of more heavy duty exercise really, or, you know, high temperatures and whatnot. And if you are exposed to high temperatures, the likelihood that you're going to need a glucose filled solution just based on you sweating a lot is low, given that you are not burning through your glycogen through intense activity, rather it is the temperature making you thermoregulate and sweat to like cool yourself down. That is, you know, a different rehydration strategy because you are not needing to push glucose really in any significant manner you are just needing to replace the fluid and the you know hypotonic concentration filled you know electrolyte mixture that comes out in your sweat and it's dependent on what you are as far as the saltiness of sweater so it depends on the person but in general isotonic solutions are used by athletes engaging in intense physical activity to replace fluids and electrolytes lost through sweating it can help maintain performance prevent dehydration and electrolyte imbalance, but this is going to be reserved more so for, I guess, a clinical, like medical setting and activity that is intense enough and or um, long enough with, you know, a concurrent amount of some level of reasonable intensity to actually justify pushing the tonicity higher, given that you have like an, a, a need that is, uh, you know, not being met via mostly fluid and a proportional lower amount of electrolytes and or absence of glucose and presence of it. Also preventing hyponatremia. Isotonic solutions can help prevent dilution of blood. So not diluting the sodium in your blood so significantly that you end up hyponatremic. This is again, probably something you don't need to worry about the condition where you have more uh, fluid intake relative to, you know, sodium excretion that you are typically not going to end up in a diluted scenario unless you are rehydrating aggressively with straight water in very long durations of intense activity and high temperatures. It's just, it's not likely that it's going to happen, but that is another situation where, you know, going a little bit more towards the isotonic side of the spectrum to actually get electrolytes back in your system would make sense. Now on the opposite side, we have hypertonic. So this is, doesn't have as much of a use case for 99% of us because most of us are going into workouts with enough glycogen to support the workout unless we're in a steep deficit, at which point you still probably wouldn't be pushing hypertonic solutions. You would just be, you know, getting that through more palatable, uh, not palatable, satiating food options because you'd be in a deficit and wanting to actually enjoy your food rather than, you know, slugging like a fucking <laughs> gooey goddamn thing that is meant for runners to just like slam down really quick. So a hypertonic solution is something that exceeds the tonicity of blood. So you are looking at, for example, the seawater example that has such a high tonicity that it will literally draw hydration out of cells. As you can see here, this dehydrated, shriveled looking cell, water is transported out from the cell. Solute concentration inside the cell is lower and you end up with a net outflow of hydration and it leads to dehydration outcomes, which can be useful rarely, <laughs> but sometimes, typically in medical context, but in a sports context, it's going to be reserved for people who 
are in like ultra endurance events where you're expending large amounts of energy for extended periods. And this is where you can get a highly concentrated source of energy quickly. And that is like the primary goal of utilizing it as opposed to, you know, having the most rapid intake of uh, fluid. You are looking for rapid assimilation of glycogen to offset, you know, the complete you know, burning through it essentially. So it's not necessarily ideal for hydrating cells as quickly as possible. That is where you would lean closer to the hypotonic to isotonic, but hypertonic has its place. It is just more in a extreme intense exercise scenario, often where time is of the essence. You don't have, you know, a lot of uh, bandwidth to slam and slug big, you know, liquid drinks because you're literally in the middle of activity. Like this is something that is more of a high level endurance athlete type thing. So, and often, you know, there are a lot of hypertonic solutions on the market that are marketed towards more of like the regular gym goer, the moderate exerciser. Again, like that's a, a category I would confidently place myself in at best. I am not going to be pushing, you know, two plus hours of super high intensity activity that really justifies the need to deploy like a goo or fucking, I don't know, even like, even like the heaviest of duty Gatorade solution. Like I don't need that. And it is just, you know, extra sugar. So anyways, it's also good for recovery after intense exercise. Um, and a hypertonic solution with carbs can be used to help replenish glycogen stores and provide nutrients for recovery with priority because it's like you're getting a highly concentrated product that is primarily geared towards fast energy as opposed to having, if you're trying to get, top up your glycogen stores in like this super diluted, you know, hypotonic solution, you would have to drink so much fluid and it would take forever. It would not be ideal or efficient for some sports context, but more few and far between. Most people are going to lean towards a hypotonic solution for the purposes in which most of us are looking for hydration. So what to look for in a formula? Should you get a formula with sugar or not? It depends on the duration and intensity of your activity. For relatively short duration activities, you likely don't need glucose as you should have sufficient muscle glycogen and liver glycogen to meet all of your exercise needs. Um, we don't need carbs to stay hydrated, but, and again, you know, some people are probably thinking, wait a minute, doesn't, you know, what about the keto example you just gave before? You should prioritize performance and use carbs when needed. Absolutely, I believe that to be the case. If carbs improve your energy, you know, use them. They will enhance the uptake of electrolytes when used strategically and depends on the tonicity of the solution. And what is the priority right now in terms of shoving electrolytes and fluid in, or is it, you know, getting a ton of energy in a concentrated format? However, like I mentioned, a lot of drinks have way too much sugar in them. And, you know, it's not necessarily always a bad thing, but the level of sugar you know, it's easy to pick on it. Like Logan likes to, you know, take companies and pick their most obscene formula like Gatorade and then say, oh, you know, Prime a million times better because it has, you know, almost no sugar and this other company has a bunch of sugar. It's like, do you think they only put the sugar in there to taste good? You think there are other formulas that are, you know, sucralose enhanced and whatnot taste like shit and it's just their, uh, they just had to use sugar. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's, I don't know if Logan intentionally overlooks these other variants, especially in big company catalogs that have multiple SKUs that include formulas that are superior to his with no sugar and almost no calories. But I, I imagine he is uh, just cherry picking strategically, which is fine. But the point is you don't need carbs peri workout if you are adequately fed and hydrated going into a session. And typically the session will only dictate that you need, you know, something like fast assimilating glucose. If you are doing something highly intensive for several hours, typically like two plus hours is kind of like a general guideline threshold for where, you know, looking at glucose might make sense, 90 to 120 minutes. And it could be, you know, crunched down depending on intensity, but that's a, a general rule of thumb. Many people overdo the glucose. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people think they need way more than they do for optimal performance and they end up just 
slamming a bunch of sugar unnecessarily, potentially burdening their GI, which could impair performance and impair hydration via the actual liquids they're trying to take into their body. Because again, remember when you have this, you know, this goo or whatever, you'd have like a gel that is super sugar dense to try and get uh, fast digesting carbs. And then you pour water on top of that and some electrolytes, you have to wait and actually dilute and absorb and facilitate the movement of all this fluid with this, you know, gel-like shit in your intestines. Like that is something that uh, is going to be slower for sure. It's not going to be as ideal of a rehydration efficient strategy. So again, just context. If you need energy bad and you are time crunched and don't have a lot of flexibility, you know, glucose could make sense. And you can have a hypotonic solution with glucose in it. And that is where you would get to just more reasonable dosages of it. And it would be based on actual needs. Like most people, again, the scenarios that we're going to be most familiar with are like, you know, one to two hour sessions um, at most per day. Um, if not less than that. And the, the need for glucose is going to be more few and far between if we were adequately fed going into the session. And worst case scenario, you might need something that is bordering on isotonic, but it's likely you can still get away with a hypotonic solution with some glucose to enhance electrolyte uptake, but not get to the degree where you are inhibiting um, efficiency dramatically by going to the iso leaning into hyper area of things, which a lot of these sports drinks go a little bit too aggressively into, in my opinion, while also trying to market to the, like the 60 minute exercise crowd, which is just a bit much. So to simplify things, just like a general guideline of all the stuff I just said, I think this is a rule of thumb that should serve you well, or the majority of you, I mean, is at least what I'm following. So for one to two hours of activity in the day, for those sweating a lot from the heat, you know, sauna, hot yoga, working in high temperatures outdoors, etc., or for those with specific diets that require more attention to be paid to electrolyte supplementation, and this category applies to the majority of people who want to optimize their hydration, you should just be drinking your volume loss in water with proportional electrolytes in a hypotonic solution. And for two plus hours of intense activity, a borderline hypotonic isotonic solution containing water, some glucose and proportional electrolytes could be worthwhile. But majority of us, you know, you're gonna be good just getting, what did you weigh before your session? And then by the end of your session, do you weigh the same amount? If not, you might have not drank enough fluid and along with that fluid should be a proportional amount of electrolytes based on how much you sweat out ideally and you know calculating that out it's pretty easy when you actually factor in the calculations are sort of built into a lot of these products all you have to do is dilute the electrolyte formula accordingly with the suggested use and then it's just how many liters do you drink based on fluid loss essentially and then you know at that point you are replacing what you need pending the formula is designed for that in mind, which is replacing fluid primarily, but also replacing the proportional loss in electrolytes with a emphasis on sodium, chloride, to a lesser extent potassium, depending on how hard you wanna lean into trying to cover your bases of deficiency and sweat, which we'll get into in a sec, and then magnesium, calcium, et cetera, um, and other trace elements. But in general, like that is the delineation in my opinion. It's zero to two hours of moderate activity where you're actually sweating. That is where you would look to, at minimum, regardless of what you're doing, you're replacing your fluid and then adding electrolytes into that fluid if you are losing enough, whatever body weight you are losing, if it's like one, 2% of your body weight, like you should be looking to adding in, I feel like, electrolytes into the fluid that you are replacing your body weight with. And getting into, you know, glucose solution territory, I think that's like the two plus hour mark. 90 to two plus hour mark for most people, depending on activity intensity. Some people might be closer, you know, 60 or whatever. It also depends. We're, we're going to say all of this on the assumption that you went into the session adequately fed and hydrated. Because if you did, you know, you're not trying to play catch up and playing catch up changes the game entirely and things become a lot more difficult to, you know, give general recommendations on. And it's very difficult to play catch up on hydration and I would not recommend trying. So coming into the session, well-fed, 
glycogen stores topped out ideally, unless you're trying to diet down for something, electrolytes topped out, hydrated, etc. And from there, you're just replacing fluid loss with the proportional electrolytes found in your sweat, which is built into the recommended use of some of the uh, top products, which we'll get into now. What is a good formula and what is a bad formula? And it depends on the situation and the person, but we'll get into a general guideline. So there are Frankly, too many formulas to pick from nowadays. It's kind of overwhelming. Fortunately, a lot of them kind of just suck and make it a bit easier. So it's easy to rule out a big chunk of them. Of the big names that most are familiar with, I figured these were the two most notable that I would use personally that people actually have high trust factor in, sell a lot, have good quality control, etc. So first off, element. Tastes salty, of course. You would expect that with a gram of sodium. But it replaces what you lose in solid proportions. Has flexibility of use cases by avoiding the use of sugar. A lot of people want to avoid having glucose when they don't need it, as do I. Like, I don't want to be forced. Just because glucose can enhance the uptake of electrolytes, it doesn't mean I want to be using it when my glycogen stores are already topped out. Like I'm not getting a benefit out of that necessarily. It would only be in the presence of, I don't know, like the context of intense activity plus sweating, two plus hours typically for me, 90 to 120 minutes plus. Only at that point of continuous, decently intensive activity would I want to push into the glucose territory. And that, of course, that's pending my nutrition is on point going into the session, etc. So I think Element is great. I think it's one of the better formulas out there that is representative of, you know, what you're sweating out and trying to replace that with an absence of glucose to allow for top flexibility. It's great for, you know, keto dieters, fasting. It's not going to break a fast, etc. Solid all around formula and naturally sweetened, which is great. Um, Liquid IV. Yeah, also a very popular one, probably the most popular. Logan <laughs> has shit on it before, which is uh, nonsense. And I think my first video was reviewing his review of Liquid IV, where he basically just said Prime is like one better than them and fucking everything, which was so stupid. But because Liquid IV for its purpose is a superior formula. So and even when you look at the sugar free version that came out recently, it's like a couple months ago, better than Prime as well. So. It's good when some sugar is needed. The traditional liquid IV formula, among the typical go-tos with sugar, the concentration of glucose makes liquid IV superior for fast rehydration as well than some of the sugar bomb formulas that lean towards you know, hypertonic, like traditional Gatorade formulas. And some of those Gatorade formulas, to be clear, they have their place. The problem though is they're also marketing to the greater than 60 minute duration exercise crowd, which is area of you know duration and intensity i don't believe necessarily justifies you know 22 grams of sugar i believe that's overkill and i think you would be better off with something like a more subtle liquid iv that has a better ratio not necessarily better ratio but just a better concentrations too of electrolytes present relative to how much you sweat out like if you think back to the sweat chart that we looked at before you're looking at proportional losses of like, you know, in an hour, you could lose 1.38 to 5.5 grams of salt, which, you know, obviously that's segregated among sodium and chloride, but you could be looking at like, you know, 1300, 1400 milligrams of sodium itself lost on the bottom end if you were a three liter a hour sweater, or it could be on the, you know, low end, 460 an hour, or 1840 even for that same liter it's highly variable depending on how much of a salty sweater you are how much you're sweating intensity of activity but i think liquid iv does a good job of kind of like bridging the gap of giving you a decent amount of potassium to cover your bases also correcting for deficiencies a little bit giving you enough sodium that's not overkill to where it could be essentially disqualifying it as like a lifestyle everyday drink because again a lot of people that aren't athletes sweating regularly are just going to be sipping electrolytes for lifestyle tasting good purposes. And that's where, you know, a liquid IV or heavy sodium formula has become less and less of a qualified good choice in those circumstances because those individuals probably have a sodium heavy diet as is that is disproportionately low in magnesium and potassium and maybe water. 
those people probably don't need more sodium. So that is kind of where the fine line of dialing in what you need for your personal situation is why this can be, can get so granular and important to choose wisely. However, I feel like it becomes a bit easier when you know, in general, most people have the same schedules on a weekly basis and know their activity, durations, intensity, and are fully capable of weighing themselves before and after a session and assessing fluid loss and also determining, you know, how many electrolytes ballpark they're losing. And if you want to get really granular on it, you can actually do sweat tests to actually see exactly what you're lo losing, what you are losing, and eh, got a bit tongue tied, and then choose the appropriate formula accordingly. Because again, if you're not a salty sweater, if you're not sweating, you know, multiple liters in a session, do you really need to go a gram per 16 ounces with uh, an element? Or do you go like a gram per 32 ounces with an element? Or do you go with a liquid IV that is half of that too? Depends on the person, but hopefully this helps to frame out how you would actually get granular on something like this rather than speculate based on, you know, marketing hype and claims because most of the people selling this stuff don't really elucidate. Well, these companies are better about actually putting out science, by the way, but like, you know, Prime and whatnot, they'll just be like, it's the fucking best, buy it, use it. I don't care if you're weight cutting, you know, 25, 30 pounds of water for fucking UFC, like rehydrate with Prime borderline kill yourself bro they don't actually say that but it's uh pretty uh <laughs> i don't know man they gotta they gotta reevaluate some shit in my opinion at least ethically so a liquid iv good when sugar is needed um among the typical go-to's with sugar i would say it's one of the best um i think it's great for sessions that are exceeding you know two hours or one to two hours it might not be as electrolyte rich as needed for those sessions though and that is where you might get into, you know, needing to mix and match, you know, putting an element in or adding a sugar-free liquid IV in on top of the sugar-filled one because they have a sugar-free one now as well, which is less calories, no sugar, and is just the same amount of sodium and potassium, or it's like plus minus 10 milligrams or something. Why they, you know, made that difference I don't really know. I feel like it was kind of uh, definitely looked cleaner as the other option. Like this is the original 500 and 370. This one is 510 and 380. They're both good though. And I think that they both have a place. It just depends on the person. So, you know, the electrolyte formula for Element, I feel is a better amount of sodium for someone sweating a lot or a salty sweater, but might not cut it from a lack of sugar aspect for individuals pushing two plus hour workouts or one to two hour workouts at very high intensity um, and liquid IV, you know, sugar-free formula that just came out recently. The sodium content may not be adequate for some people, but it also depends on all the factors I mentioned. And I would say if you were to pick one as a lifestyle drink, the, L the liquid IV one's probably better. If you're picking one as a hydration electrolyte formula for zero to two hours of exercise, you're probably looking at elements. And then above and beyond two hours, you're looking at liquid IV with some amount of mixture of maybe adding elements on top for extra electrolyte or sugar-free liquid IV, or just more sugar-filled. Like, I don't know how intense your activity is. So hopefully that gives some context though. Like you can actually break it down into segments of exercise intensity, fluid loss, um, and ultimately it is just going to be, are you energy depleted in your workout? Is it affecting your intensity and how much fluid are you losing in the workout? And those things you can manually correct pretty easily based on performance metrics and also the scale. So it's not very hard to look at the scale before and after and then figure out how much more or less should I drink. And of that fluid, given I'm losing this many liters per session, how much electrolyte should be in there based on you know my sweat amounts and then you just fill accordingly with your water and your electrolytes which makes it a bit simpler and more easy to uh, wrap your head around questionable formulas ones that are not necessarily uh, ideal or marketed in ways that i don't necessarily agree with gatorade so it kind of depends because again they could be seen as good like again they're a behemoth in the industry they're obviously doing things right for something but this chart they have for every occasion, the hydration continuum, like there is absolutely a leaning towards making something taste better than maximizing electrolyte intake because they are presumably afraid to have it taste too salty. That is my assumption when I see formulas that will not exceed 
160 sodium in almost every formula and at best 310. It's like, can you imagine for, you know, two plus hours of exercise and you sweating out, you know, two to six liters of fluid that you would only lose this much sodium? Like it's impossible. And then along with that, you are forcing yourself to have 90 calories of sugar is that a ratio that is ideal like do you want to be pushing hypertonic solution territory to try and get the inadequate amount of sodium relative to the amount of sweat that you're pouring out it might not be ideal and so some of their formulas i think are good and i think could be good uh you know lifestyle drinks are also good for like you know the zero to two hour mark where you just or you just need something tasty to make sure you're hydrating because you're otherwise not going to drink enough water Taste is a huge thing, you know, if it doesn't taste good, then it's kind of out the window how effective or not it is. Because if the person is not going to drink it, then it doesn't matter. So there is stuff in here that, again, I think Logan uh, did not give justice to and should have picked the most comparable formula to his, but instead formula to his, being tongue-tied again. But he chose like the most egregious <laughs> you know, not congruent one with uh, what could be perceived to be just objectively unhealthy, you know, mark numbers on it. And like, oh, bunch of sugar. Oh, it has, uh, you know, less electrolytes cumulatively, even though it's, you know, prime has no sodium and it's like fucking 801 milligrams of total electrolytes or something. I forget what it is, 871 instead of 870, you know, one up them, whatever the fuck. That thing, Gatorade is not the best, but I would say it's probably not the worst either. It just depends on the situation. Next up, we have Ultima. So this is a really popular one nowadays, seemingly. And this is the formula that I could find. Zero calories, 20 servings per container. And it is leaning heavier on the potassium. It looks like it's trying to be like a lifestyle, you know, hydration formula, which is really what high prime should be but they will never you know market it specifically for that purpose it's always going to be you know the athlete's drink or whatever sodium 55 milligrams pretty low you know you can already tell this is not going to be the best thing for actually sweating but then they go super heavy on the calcium and phosphorus and magnesium relative to the sodium content so to me it's just kind of odd because these are things that are not necessarily sweat out in significant quantities but on top of that they're not really deficient in significant quantities either like potassium sorry so magnesium is very deficient in most people as well as potassium but calcium and phosphorus are not so and even when you're sweating the amounts are not going to be that significant so to me you're kind of telling me this has to be a everyday hydration i just want my water to taste good kind of product when it has almost no sodium like that is presumably the idea is to balance out a otherwise sodium rich diet model encourage fluid intake get some potassium in there that is otherwise deficient and can you know otherwise impair sodium excretion or reabsorption or what have you depending on if there's too much or too little potassium etc this looks like a hydration formula for drinking more fluid, essentially, and some potassium and magnesium, almost like a more subtle version of Prime. But then it has a little bit of sodium as if like you were going to sweat just like, I don't know, a little bit, but not exert yourself that hard. And then just like way too much calcium and phosphorus, I think proportionally for what it is. Because if I'm going to be sipping on this as a lifestyle drink, I don't necessarily want to get another 70, 140, 210 milligrams of phosphorus to get my 500, 750 potassium and actually, you know, sip on this thing most of the day, which is what I would do with a formula like this. Like I use it to make my water I am drinking taste good and get my, you know, 3.7 liters or whatever for my everyday intake so i just don't think it's that conducive to a it's kind of like trying to be a lifestyle drink but sort of not doing it well i feel like like i would like other than the sucralose content purport relative to you know stevia and you could argue about you know natural versus artificial sweeteners like you could argue that prime is better than this in some circumstances, depending on the potassium intake of the individual, of course. But, you know, most people are going to be more deficient in potassium and magnesium and not so much sodium, but also almost not really, not really a lot of calcium or phosphorus to justify these like, you know, heavier dosages in the absence of sweating. 
And we can only assume there's an absence of sweating because there's almost no sodium here. So pfft, that's kind of like where it leaves me. I don't think it's the worst I've seen, but it's you know questionable for such a popular and good formula, supposedly. Next up, Prime. You know, obviously, you guys know at this point probably what I'm gonna say. I think it's horrible that it's marketed like it's a high sodium drink. They compare their electrolyte blend to formulas that actually have sodium in it to replace what you sweat out when you're sweating. And they'll say, you know, 871 milligrams compared to, you know, liquid IVs, 870 or whatever it is to one up them. It's like, no, you, you one up nothing. You have just misrepresented what your electrolyte blend is comprised of and have conflated the most important ingredients with all of the others, which are not useless or unimportant. Like potassium is important. Magnesium is important. You have good amounts of those, potentially too high of an amounts of those. But it's just like, you know, it, it almost seems just like a rushed, a rushed formula to me, as in there was little thought and or little education that went into it to the, you know, ambassador slash spokespeople, namely Logan, who just like doesn't even care to look into it. So this is the formula. It's, you know, 25 calories, has a couple grams of sugar, potassium, 700 milligrams has some B vitamins and trace amounts. The BCAAs that are not going to, uh, you know, help at all. And magnesium at 123.9. So, you know, these numbers, I don't hate. I think the potassium is a little heavy, especially for a drink that children are gonna be, you know, cranking left, right, and center. And also for a drink that athletes are gonna be using as they get more and more influence that this is the go-to solution. Um, and magnesium at 124, as a citrate, you start to wonder, are you going to get into people shitting themselves territory as you're using too much of this? Because the reality is a lot of people that use magnesium, they're using it for the laxative properties to enhance you know, bowel movement support. So having 124 milligrams, while it's a good dose, it's per 500 milliliters, which is pretty damn concentrated. And 700 potassium, you know, I keep forgetting this is a half liter solution. It's not even a liter. That's super fucking concentrated. So this is the most, uh, I guess, osmotically active, like what would be the, uh, I don't know, it's like the most osmotic of the magnesium bound uh, formats. And by that, I mean, it is literally going to pull fluid into the intestine because of the format chosen, the dosage. Like this could be something that at the quantities that people will be ingesting to offset dehydration. Because again, the primary point of this is not to get sodium in. So if you were even to use this in athletics, you have to hope that you can at least achieve fluid replacement in adequate amounts to offset losses. But is that going to be realistic for somebody losing one to three liters per hour in, you know, a football game or, you know, a run or whatever? Like, if you are doing an activity like that where you need to slam, like, four primes an hour to get in your fluid and you are getting, you know, 500 milligrams of magnesium citrate through that, are you just going to shit your brains out and overdo your potassium intake, dilute the shit out of your sodium that is not present in this formula at all and is, you're relying on your stores for it. Like, it's just uh, a really, really hard to wrap your head around application. Like, it is something that I can see as a lifestyle drink. You would drink like one to two of to top up your fluid intake for those who are a little bit deficient in water and maybe potassium and magnesium too, but it's more of like a supplement for a lacking diet model than something that would ever be used for fluid replacement in exercise and high temperature exposure, and certainly not for electrolyte replacement in the context of like more highly active exercise where you're sweating proportionally, you know, much greater amounts of sodium. Like there's just not really a place for it in athletics, in my opinion. So, and again, the misrepresentation of it being sponsored, you know, pushed through sponsored athletes that are in endurance activities, um, highest level sports on the planet, pretend they use this shit or care about it at all. It's just uh, a bit, a bit much. So when you're making a product like this, you kind of have to decide what the target application is. Is it taste good? Would you sip on it and replace your fluid with it? Is it for hangovers? Um, is it for those who moderate, you know, moderately exercise but aren't competing in like 
hyper intense endurance sports? Is it for marathon runners? And I feel it's important to explain what the application is quite specifically. So you don't have customers blinded being told that your product is just the best compared to the others in the market. Cause oftentimes it sucks when, when companies do that. Oftentimes you can tell the formula sucks because there is going to be context in which there is no perfect formula. There's going to be applications in which it's shitty or applications in which it's amazing. It just needs to be highlighted specifically, which it's for. Otherwise it is bad via the marketing. Like it's one of those products where I can't think of a more fitting product to elucidate how important the instructions are. Cause it's like, you know, I, I guess with pre-workout or something else that you take for performance, everyone is, has the same goal in mind, timing, like every, all it is is like dose response at that point, essentially, you know, there could be some level of the same, you know, fuckery and uh, finagling of the formulation applications that are applicable. But with hydration, it's like, there is certain ways you can actually impede performance and hydration outcomes via the incorrect choice of a formula. This is where it becomes hyper important. <laughs> if that's even a way to say, highlight how important it is. Very, very important that you pick the right thing. So yeah, it's, uh, you gotta make sure that it's almost what you should look for in my opinion for a company to really separate themselves. It becomes a lot easier to weed out the nonsense and companies that are misleading and putting out not highly efficacious formulas when they are marketing their formula as the go-to for all of hydration. Because it's like, there's no way you could cover everyone's basis for all situations. And when you try to do that, you've kind of lost me because I just don't trust you at that point. So since last year, you know, I made this video, the first video on Prime, I think in October, um, and I've had electrolytes on our radar for since last year as well. Um, and I suppose the you know prime stuff has sort of expedited my interest in coming up with something myself, um, but it was already in the works. So it was just fortuitous timing that ours has actually been available for a week or two now at the time of this video. And I felt it was worthwhile to highlight what application ours is specifically designed for and not designed for specifically. So you could shop elsewhere and pick something that is more applicable for that and educational dissecting at the same time, because I don't know many companies that are, you know, dissecting the shit out of their choices and why. So a lot of people ask me to make this formula and it is based on what I would use personally for my, what I believe most people in the fitness industry or those who follow you know, my brand and Gorilla Mind would align with in general. So what I formulated was what I'd want to see for the most general use case applicable to the health conscious individual who exercises regularly and doesn't know where to start on hydration. So that sounds kind of vague, but we'll get more granular because there are polar extremes that we absolutely don't apply for and I would not use for those applications. And you may not even need an electrolyte formula at all. Like some people just are fine with water. So the target demo for our formula, who it's not for, first off, the person who doesn't exercise at all and sits around all day, like that person probably has more than enough sodium on deck to not use anything. Because again, any of these formulas, if they have any amount of sodium in them and you were not sweating any appreciable amount out of your body, supplementing sodium on top of what is probably a dominated diet to begin with is likely not going to be good outcome. Like it's not going to be helpful. It may actually be counterproductive to health and performance. So if you are somebody who just sits around, lounges around, does nothing essentially, you probably don't need more sodium. In fact, you probably need more potassium and magnesium and water at most. Like that would be the typical deficiencies and shortcomings of the standard, you know, American Western diet and, you know, not really sweating much at all. So those individuals, you know, obviously it would be ideal to, you know, tweak your diet and start exercising and stuff. But those individuals from a hydration standpoint, those are the people who would benefit from something that is really low in sodium content, tastes better, that encourages you to drink enough fluid per day potentially has some amount of potassium and magnesium to offset deficiencies and help balance out, you know, the sodium, so to speak. But once you get into the realm of athletic performance, touching grass, being outside, outdoor labor, high temperatures, anything that makes you sweat, that's kind of where those formulas become 
a precipitously uh, less viable and ideal formula. So a prime, for example, would be the ideal formula for somebody on that polar extreme who is just completely sedentary, has the traditional sodium heavy dominant diet, doesn't sweat any of it out, is low on potassium and magnesium. Like maybe that person could benefit from a prime. Certainly possible. Or people with certain genetic predispositions, certainly possible those people might benefit from it as well. Once you start sweating and actually doing sports, you know, getting in the gym, running, whatever it is. Now we're kind of like getting away from the primes and we start to get into, should we be replacing sodium, glucose? What are we looking at here? So let's go to the other polar opposite side of the extreme to inactivity and look at another target demo our formula is not for. And those are individuals who are involved in activities that involve hours and hours of prolonged endurance and continuous physical effort, such as long distance running, um, cycling, triathlons, ultra marathons. You know, these can all lead to significant fluid and electrolyte loss through sweat and also huge amounts of glycogen depletion. So carbohydrate and electrolyte drinks can help maintain hydration and provide an energy source to sustain performance in those circumstances. And that is what we are not meant for as well. So this is where Prime also, you know, falls short and puts out the misleading marketing about, you know, oh yeah, no sugar, so great. You know, you don't want any carbs. We have the least sugar, better for you option. For athletics, heavy duty intensive athletics for like a fighter or something who's trying to, you know, replenish as quickly as possible after a weigh-in or whatever. Like it is the worst possible option for sure. Not the better for you one, so. You know, ever to imply that a, you know, the better for you option, it just, it highly depends on your, your baseline state. Like if you are the sedentary guy, sure, prime might be the better for you option, especially if you refuse to drink enough water because it just, water tastes like shit to you or whatever, and you need sucralose enhanced water to like drink your fluid. Okay. You know, like maybe it is better for you in that circumstance, but for an actual athlete in endurance events, especially UFC fighters, football players, runners, whatever. And obviously as you start to get to like ultra marathon territory, triathlon, stuff like this, it's like a level above like, you know, being in a, like a, you know, a sport where you might be more stop and go and whatnot. And you might not even need glucose for some of those, uh, you know, less intensive things. But ultimately at high level sport, you are certainly out of the prime territory essentially every single time, in my opinion. So the demo for us and our formula, by the way, I haven't even pulled up the formula. This is what box it comes in. We have four flavors, cherry blackout. We have our OG jungle juice flavor that we have in our pre-workouts, cotton candy grape, as well as our rocket pop bombsicle. We may change uh, the flavors in the future or do new ones on top and, you know, maybe lean in some of the, uh, you know, energy drink flavor directions, because these have been probably our most well-received flavor systems to date is our energy drinks that are fucking incredible, by the way. But these electrolyte formulas are very, very good too, in my opinion. And they're naturally sweetened, which we'll get into shortly. And to be determined how we expand the, uh, the skews of flavors. But those are the four right now. And they, they came out really well. So anyways, the target demo for ours in particular those who are health conscious exercise regularly, but typically don't push past the two hour mark, I would say, of like grueling sessions. So you don't sit around all day and do nothing. You also don't exercise for two plus hours. Like to me, I'm in the gym for like an hour and I will, you know, go for walks. Typically low intensity, steady state stuff. I'm trying to get into uh, really focusing on doing like at least once a week, like a hit session though and uh, really focusing on zone two cardio more and actually, you know, sweating a bit more in the sauna and whatnot. So, so for me, I'm kind of like, I don't necessarily think I'm representative of the average health conscious person, but I think a lot of people in my sphere are probably similar in that most of us aren't doing like aggressive, long endurance activity, but we're absolutely not sedentary. Like we work out regularly, eat well, are health conscious want something that's going to be supportive of our diet and correct for any sort of deficiencies that are difficult to cover, but also cover our basis for sweat content. So it's definitely, there's no glucose in our formula. I don't think it was justified to include that, at least in this iteration of it. If we end up being successful with it, maybe we, you know, branch it out into some of the more different uh, 
categories of applications, but this is the one that applies for me personally. And I think will apply for most people where it's ideal for like one to two hour workouts with a decent amount of sweating, you know, hot yoga, sauna, hiking, most sports, I would say hot days and temperature induced sweating. And I believe I already went through the uh, temperature induced sweating versus exercise data. So don't need to revisit that keto dieting. I think it's great for as well, because we do have a efficacious amount of sodium in there. Fasting, I think it was also, it's also great for it's nearly calorie free or as close as you're going to get in a formula like this. It's not going to break your fast like a liquid IV might that at least the sugar based one, um, or even like a prime would, I think it's like 25 calories for a prime. So the primary formula attributes, just the hit list, and then we'll get uh, granular on it. So 3073 milligrams of electrolytes. Um, I may tweak the ratios in the future, but I think the balance is very solid that we've we've got right now. And I've spent so, the amount of tweaks on it has been wild over the past year. But the sheer number, again, doesn't mean shit. You know, when Logan says we have 871 of what, bro, like of what in there. So I will break that down in a sec. What are 3073 are we have zero sugar. We have it's fasting friendly. It is no artificial sweeteners or colors. It's naturally sweetened with stevia. Still tastes amazing despite the no sucralose. It includes critical trace elements found in sweat that are often very overlooked, which we'll get into shortly. And I haven't at least personally seen other companies do this, but I'm sure they exist. But it was something that I thought was unique. 30 servings per box. Comprehensive hydration with an efficacious dose of sodium chloride is going to taste salty. That's expected. But it still tastes amazing in my opinion. It just depends on your tolerability of sweat. Just be prepared. It's a little bit salty. And let's get into it. Let's get granular on the shit. So average dietary intake of electrolytes and how I arrived at the ratios we have. So the goal again was to try and hit the sweet spot of everyday lifestyle hydration meets the average zero to two hour exercise per day or per other day kind of person. So we balanced a top up everyday formula to address common potassium and magnesium deficiencies, which is, you know, admittedly, I even have those, which is most people are supplementing with something for one or two of those with a proportional weight put where you need it still for sodium and performance. But without going too extreme on the sodium side either, where it may only be ideal for the heaviest of salty sweaters, because again, kind of going back to the liquid IV element scenario, it's like, do you want to go a gram? Are you a super salty sweater? And then the potassium, is it enough for your current diet model? And then you have the liquid IV, which is like half a gram and it has, you know, more potassium than liquid than element does. And the proportions are different and slightly, you know, more evened out, but it also doesn't have enough sodium for your needs based on the amount of liters you're sweating out per hour, et cetera, et cetera. That's a fine line to a fine, <laughs> a fine needle to thread, I shall say. So for us, this is what we thought was best. And this is based on a fuckload of tweaks. Chloride, we have in totality 1,610 milligrams. So this is broken over sodium and potassium chloride. Sodium, as sodium chloride, 750 milligrams. So I feel like this is like pretty, you know, close to the sweet spot of not uh, being excessive, not being too little you know, trying to accommodate the sweat rates of people who are typically exercising, you know, one to two hours per day, doing the activities that we're probably going to be doing, which is like, you know, gym plus cardio post gym or what have you, or moderate activity, you know, endurance activities. <laughs> I say endurance in quotes, because I guess for me, it's probably a bit different than maybe you guys, but yeah, like zero to two hours of moderately active, uh, intensive activity. I feel like this covered a lot of basis. These formulas are also designed with suggested use to fit into 16 ounce serving sizes once you actually dilute it. So this, you would mix in 16 ounces of water and shake thoroughly. So when you convert that over actual ounces, you're kind of looking at, you know, for two servings or two stick packs, you're looking at essentially a liter of fluid. So you're technically looking at like a 1500 milligram per liter sodium solution with our formula in particular, which I think threads the needle quite nicely where we are not. Because again, I am quite aware that most people's diets are still on the heavier sodium side, but we are, 
I would say, at least of the target demo that this product is intended for, a little bit more conscious about our potassium, sodium, magnesium intakes, probably supplement accordingly as is with magnesium, you know, bisglycinate separately or what have you. And we kind of keep an eye on our blood pressure, regulate our fluid intake accordingly, make sure we drink enough, we exercise, we can tolerate, you know, decent amounts of stress, etc. I think that this is uh, enough to cover the sweat bases of somebody who is sweating one to three liters an hour and isn't too excessive where we're pushing into, you know, you're just exacerbating a, you know, sodium dominance issue in individuals. So, um, and also just isn't so obscenely salty that it's gross to drink because if you don't want to drink it, kind of defeats the whole purpose of the whole thing in general. Like some people will ingest things purely for performance, but a lot of people won't. They need it to taste amazing for you to want to actually sip it through your workout, especially when you are doing intensive activity. You know, you're training to failure or whatever. And do you want to be, you know, sipping on a liter of something that tastes like seawater? Probably not. So you have to be mindful of this too. And what is actually, again, without overlooking, as you get granular on these electrolyte ratios, it becomes quite easy to overlook the fluid replacement as like the overarching big thing. We need to make sure that enough fluid is drank. Like that is one of the primary concerns too. So having it taste good enough to do that, very important as well. So it might not be perfect, but to me, this was like, felt like threading the needle. Maybe it's tweaked in the future, but this is what I feel is pretty solid and seems to be like a happy medium between what are, you know, the best formulas on the market as is anyways, or at least the most, you know, highly acclaimed and reviewed and uh, sought after one. So, you know, I like that 750 number personally, um, and it has served me well so far and it still tastes incredible. So I'm really, really happy with it. And that's even with natural sweeteners. So now getting into um, and obviously the chloride proportionally, you're looking at, you know, ranges of 710 to 2,840 milligrams per liter loss per hour or milligrams per liter lost. And then, you know, the amount of that is multiplied out over, you know, one to three liters, depending on how much it is in general. I feel like we bridged, you know, the gap quite nicely and I'm happy with how it came out. So now getting into the more, uh, you know, the things that are commonly deficient. So this is really hard to guesstimate in terms of what is the ideal, but I feel like our ratio was uh, not considerate solely on what is coming out in sweat and is also considerate of the fact that the standard diet that we are, you know, basing a lot of our thoughts about sodium on, that same diet is typically like a thousand milligrams off in many cases of what would be a good potassium intake, especially relative to the amount of uh, sodium being taken in, the recommended potassium intake for the average adult is 3,400 to 4,700 milligrams per day for men and 2,600 to 3,600, depending on which guidelines you want to go by for women. So with us, you know, the ideal potassium intake will vary person to person, obviously, and can go up or down based on body weight, diet model, exercise, muscle mass, how much you sweat, genetics, and a lot of other factors, most men are consuming around 2,700 to 3,000 milligrams a day. And in women, standard intake is 2,000 to 2,300 milligrams of potassium per day. So on the high end of the spectrum, like worst case scenario, at least based on these averages, men could be upwards of 2,000 milligrams off of what they need or as little as 400 milligrams off of what they need. But deficient from all angles essentially is the average man. And for women, you know, the same can be said, all but to a lesser proportional degree, like 1,600 milligram deficiency at worst, at best 300 milligram deficiency, but all angles essentially deficient. And this is a mineral that is not commonly supplemented because there are no highly concentrated potassium pills really available. It is only as of recent that, you know, potassium rich electrolyte formulas have kind of emerged um, in the supplement industry. So. This is something that is just often deficient and just left, left that way. In addition, it has kind of a cumulatively problematic effect whereby sodium and potassium have some kind of like counterbalancing action against one another. So potassium inhibits sodium reabsorption by the kidney and a low potassium diet enhances renal sodium reabsorption. So if you have enhanced renal sodium reabsorption, plus you have a sodium dominant diet, 
plus you have a potassium deficient diet, like you can just imagine where the electrolyte imbalance issues and fluid balance issues can stem from. And a lot of people have the sodium dependent blood pressure changes. Oftentimes is just basic electrolyte balance issues and fluid intake not being accounted for properly. And in addition to that, you sweat during exercise too. And it's not as much potassium as it is sodium and chloride, of course, but it is notable nonetheless. On the low end, you have 160 milligrams, upwards of 390 milligrams per liter. And then you spread that out over one to three liters per hour. Like you could get upwards of, you know, a gram plus of potassium lost during exercise per hour, depending on how much you're sweating, how much of a potassium rich sweater you are etc. So not only are we dealing with a baseline state of deficiency, but in addition to that, you're trying to cover your basis for sweat, assuming that this formula is being used for actual exercise, which is what it is intended for. It is a not meant to be just sipped on, you know, in a state of inactivity, like I mentioned. It is not for the sedentary individual who does not exercise and sweat at all. That is where maybe a prime or something might be more applicable. So for somebody who is actually sweating too, we have to not only you know, work backwards from a state of deficiency probably, but then also cover this 160 to 390 milligram per liter base. So for me, you know, despite potassium being less concentrated in sweat than sodium and chloride proportionally leaning into it in this formula at this dosage, I feel like it works towards accomplishing both goals of making up ground for the deficiency and covering your basis for additional potassium excreted in sweat, which can still be significant and notable. So that is the justification for 545 milligrams and it is deriving from potassium chloride, dipotassium phosphate, and potassium iodide. We'll get into what the other ones are there for and why shortly. Next up, we have magnesium as magnesium bisglycinate at 100 milligrams. So the recommended magnesium intake for the average adult is 400 to 420 milligrams per day for men and 310 to 320 milligrams per day for women. Despite most people already being behind on this number, many well-respected researchers, nutrition experts believe that this target is actually too low. And just like any other electrolyte, ideal magnesium intake will still vary person to person based on body weight, diet, exercise, muscle mass, you know, how much you sweat, all but more negligibly with magnesium, genetics, and a lot of other stuff too. But most men on average are consuming around 250 to 350 milligrams per day, seemingly, and women around 225 to 275 milligrams per day, with the top end of that range being magnesium yields in the diet of individuals who actually supplement with magnesium separately on top of that. So some of these individuals that are getting, you know, the 350 in men through their diet and 275 from women in their diet, they are actually actively supplementing on top of that to reach their recommended daily intakes, they're aware of their diet being deficient and still had to supplement accordingly to make up that ground because they couldn't do it through their diet, even with the awareness that it's not ideal. So that was interesting to me that these individuals who are even knowingly going out of their way to take magnesium separately had such a difficult time correcting their diet for it that they still went and got the supplement and used it on top. And it's actually what I do too. So you know, it was just interesting to see it play out in the data like that though, too. So magnesium is sweat out at a concentration of approximately zero to 36 milligrams per liter. So like worst case scenario, you're sweating out like a hundred milligrams an hour, which for me, this is kind of where you don't want to put in too much magnesium. And some might argue that magnesium doesn't have a place in an electrolyte formula at all. And it's highly debatable. But again, this is kind of our approach to the hybrid lifestyle slash moderate exerciser, not intense endurance guy, but like, you know, reasonably fit, actively exercising individual who is probably around here, you know, hitting his 350 milligrams per day, but can't get up to the 420 or needs to get more than that because this is just too low in general for optimal function, performance, cognitive ability. Like there is significant overlap with magnesium in so many processes in the body, especially cognitively, sleep quality, testosterone production. Like there's so much stuff. I digress. <laughs> Basically the goal similarly to potassium is to cover the basis as well as the sweat rate. So the problem with the diet is it's not as easily correctable seemingly as some of the other minerals. Today's soil is depleted of minerals and therefore the crops and vegetables grown in that soil are not as mineral rich 
as they used to be. Approximately half of the U.S. population consumes less than the required amount of magnesium, and many would assert it's more than that. Even those who str and that's just a vague, you know, number. Approximately half, you know, it's probably more. Even those who strive for better nutrition in whole foods can fall short due to magnesium removal during food processing. Serum magnesium levels also do not reflect total body magnesium status. So at this point, I've talked to countless experts in nutrition, supplementation, pharmacology, biology, biohacking. Like I've talked to a lot of the who's who in the industry when it comes to people I trust for my own education. And I'm as interested as you guys are about what they use, what they don't use, why they justify in ingesting a certain supplement or drug. One of the most commonly used and recommended supplements without fail among these individuals is a magnesium supplement. So, and I use one every day as well. A supplement is often commonly used but to see it used in almost every single individual that you trust and find to be like highly educated about nutrition, biochemistry, et cetera, it's kind of like, okay, this is one of the no brainer ones in general. Um, not for everyone, of course, but at least for me and for a lot of people I respect and trust, it is for them too, for similar reasons. So you don't see sweat a significant amount out, you sweat some, and a lot of people have to play pretty aggressive catch up with it to begin with. And if you're sweating, I don't know, like multiple liters per day, like you can imagine you are exacerbating a deficiency fairly significantly, which is already hard to get into the hundreds of milligrams of good intake through whole foods in. So that is where supplementation is like pretty justified, I would say, in my opinion. And that's you know largely the justification for putting in the formula, covering the basis of deficiency and sweat rate. So while different types of magnesium can be useful in specific situations, like if you wanna take a dump, for example, you know, magnesium citrate, top choice apparently. We chose what many perceive to be a higher quality chelated form of magnesium, magnesium bisglycinate. So not only does magnesium bisglycinate have high bioavailability, it appears to be one of, if not the least likely to cause digestive distress and diarrhea. So that's probably the safest option for correcting a long-term deficiency and avoiding GI issues mid-exercise, which is you don't want to be in the middle of a sports game and have to shit yourself because you took like drank three primes or something, which again, when you look at their formula, I was kind of surprised even that they, you know, didn't think this through. They literally have magnesium citrate at 124 milligrams in 500 milliliters. Like that is pretty fucking concentrated in my opinion. Like, we have a hundred per 16 ounces as well, but it is in a format that should be less osmotically active, as in it's not going to draw as much water into the intestine and will avoid the, you know, GI distress, diarrhea outcomes. Like a lot of people are using that form of magnesium in order to poo. Like ours is literally to correct deficiency, um, support health, even the, gly the glycinate, the bisglycinate, glycine component of it can also be helpful, all but at small yield quantities, but it's still there to help balance out a methionine rich diet as well and has many other benefits. If you wanna look up, you know, the benefits of glycine, I've talked about it before, but they are numerous. You can find them online pretty easily. But, you know, not only will bisglycinate lower the chance of having to take a emergency dump mid-exercise, but it should enhance the hydrating capacity of the formula in general, given that the lack of osmotic effect present with the bisglycinate as in it won't draw as much water into the intestines as other forms of magnesium. It seems to be the ideal candidate for, you know, correcting deficiency. And again, this formula is not necessarily meant to be something you're pushing in the, you know, two plus hour exercise territory range anyways, where glucose inclusion might otherwise be a bit more justified. So for us, like I'm not imagining somebody is going to be pushing more than you know, a few packs a day, depends on the person, of course, but I'm, I kind of see this as hitting the sweet spot of, you're not overdoing it past the deficiency and getting into excess territory. You are offsetting the amount you're sweating, plus playing catch up on the deficiency, using the most high quality format of ingredient possible to yield the best effect with the least side effect burden with the most efficacious outcome desired. So it's just like multiple birds with one stone in my opinion. And I felt it was some formulas don't have magnesium at all. Um, some of the really highly uh, acclaimed formulas like, you know, Element has 
has some magnesium. They have, let's see, 60 milligrams. For us, I thought 100 hit the mark of threading the needle of not being excessive, correcting for blatant deficiency, um, and having a format that is going to be better tolerated and more bioavailable overall. Looks like they're using magnesium malate for theirs. And they have stevia leaf extract. This is a good overall formula, by the way, element. I think it's good. But um, yeah, this is my justification for what we're doing. So that's the magnesium component as bisglycinate, 100 milligrams. Now, next up, we have, and by the way, if you want to dilute this formula more, there's no reason you can't. Like that's one of the problems with Prime, I suppose, in their RTDs is you're kind of forced to just drink what is in there. But it's good that they have the stick packs too, so you can actually modulate accordingly when you want to dilute more. Because Element, for example, their suggested use, I believe, is 16 to 32 ounces. For us, you could absolutely do the same. If you need more dilution, you need to go more, even further in the hypotonic direction or the... Uh, burden of sodium is too high for your needs or what have you and you just want more fluid proportionally like there are ways to manipulate it where you don't have to follow the strict guidelines as long as you understand why you're doing what you're doing that's what's important and hopefully this video helps sort of guide that decision making process next up we have calcium as calcium citrate at 50 milligrams there are I would say less forms of calcium to pick from than you know magnesium. The highest elemental yield is calcium carbonate, but it seems to be very constipating. Um, it's also the cheapest and least seemingly lowest quality proportionally. Calcium citrate is typically the go-to of the available options, I mean, despite the you know potential osmotically active component of that I just discussed, the magnesium citrate. Calcium citrate at this dosage compared to the other options seems to be the go-to and does not seem to have any GI distress issues associated with its use. The recommended calcium intake for the average adult is 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams per day for men and women. Most men are consuming around 1,000 to 1,100 per day and women around 825 to 850 milligrams of calcium per day. So similarly to potassium and magnesium, the goal here is not just to cover ground of pre-existing deficiency, but also cover sweat calcium loss simultaneously. So that sweat rate appears to be between zero and 120 milligrams per liter. So depending on the individual, depending on the concentration of sweat, you could be anywhere from zero upwards of 360 milligrams lost per liter or 360 milligrams lost per hour in spread out over three liters, for example, worst case scenario, in a state of likely minor deficiency. So this is where 50 milligrams calcium is not something I see as something that is necessary to supplement. And a lot of people wouldn't put it in an electrolyte formula. For us, with the propensity to have a sweat rate that could go as high as 120 milligrams per liter, as well as the fact that a lot of people are operating on the low end of the recommended allowance or recommended intake. That was something I felt, okay, trying to just cover our basis with a 50 milligram per 16 ounce solution could be worthwhile. And obviously that could be further diluted to a full liter if uh, desired, but yeah, you know, this is in an electrolyte formula where you're sweating out minerals, you gotta make the judgment call. Do you wanna be covering your bases or not on how many things and how important is it? For calcium, you know, you could flip a coin on it, but I feel like based on what I'm seeing and where intakes are landing relative to potential sweat rates, having a low, a low amount that is not nothing, but is still there was uh, potentially worthwhile. Next up, we have phosphorus at 18 milligrams and similar to calcium in the thought process on that. This is one that most people are actually having enough of. So most men are consuming around 1500 milligrams per day, women around 1200 per day, which for men exceeds the highest end of any age bracket RDA, which is 1250 milligrams a day. For women, they're about 50 milligrams off of a bracket that is seemingly changing based on if you're a almost adult but still a teenager teenager versus not which is interesting how sometimes these ranges will just like jump based on all of a sudden you're 19 versus 18 or now you're 51 versus 50 and now all of a sudden your calcium requirements or something have changed dramatically it almost reminds me of the protein discussion like oh yeah your protein needs when you're you know young and can build muscle are 
lower, but then when you're older and you're like, have a harder time building muscle, now you need to have more protein. It's like, why didn't I just build the fucking muscle to begin with or the bone integrity or the what have you so I don't have to be playing catch up necessarily. So anyways, I am working off of the assumption of optimizing and offsetting deficiency ideally. Um, and with phosphorus, we're not really worried about deficiency, but worst case scenario, best case scenario, you're losing almost none in sweat. And worst case scenario is you're losing, you know, like 48 milligrams per liter. In one study, I found a 4.8 milligram per 100 milliliter sweat rate. So for phosphorus, you know, we're just covering our basis. And this was the yield of a 100 milligram um, dipotassium phosphate inclusion um, that also contributed partly to the potassium yield. Moving on to taurine. This is a unique one as a osmotic regulator. So we have a thousand milligrams in there and it was included specifically to be a complementary osmotic regulator that is shown to modulate cell volume, uh, mitochondrial function, stabilize cell membranes, support calcium homeostasis, as well as enhance energy metabolism and notably from the ergogenic side, enhance endurance exercise performance among several other attributes like this is tied to fertility outcomes, it's tied to heart health, it's tied to so many things. And with taurine, this is one kind of like active ingredient that I felt was worthwhile to add to a, what is probably an endurance related formula ultimately for you to be sweating enough over, you know, one to two hours to actually, you know, include electrolytes. Presumably there is a benefit to be had from the inclusion of taurine to actually regulate fluid balance in and out of cells, um, support as a osmotic regulator, as mentioned, you know, the uh, endurance exercise, like there's a lot of attributes of it that are attractive, especially in the context of a formula that includes minerals, like the calcium homeostasis support. It's just a good ingredient overall. And I felt it had a place in the formula that was unique and gave a unique upside that may not be found in traditional electrolyte formulas. Next up, we have menaquinone or menaquinone. Some people say it differently. Seven, MK7, 50 micrograms. MK7, is typically synthesized through bacterial fermentation. However, as a result of its low availability in the diet, deficiency is quite common. So I added it specifically as a safe measure for supporting calcium metabolism in particular with the calcium inclusion and cardiovascular health. So this is something that a lot of people are supplementing separately as a low microgram quantity for it to have a efficacious effect. Felt like a good complementary ingredient based on the other inclusions. Next up, we have probably the most unique uh, inclusion that I don't know if it's been done before, but iodine from potassium iodide at 50 micrograms, a very low concentration, but high bang for your buck ingredient. Something that is liter literally used to make thyroid hormones in the body. And interestingly, something I learned from Stan Efforting a long time ago is how many athletes are iodine deficient because of the concentration of it excreted in sweat. And it can have significant ramifications for those not replacing it accordingly. A lot of people don't realize how highly concentrated it is in sweat. So there's several studies reflecting what those concentrations are, but this is one that I chose as an example. It's called electrolyte loss in sweat and iodine deficiency in a hot environment. And basically what they did was it evaluated the sweat contents of 13 soccer student athletes who sweat during a one hour game and also assessed iodine status to 100 sedentary students who didn't sweat during the game as they didn't participate. The results were pretty surprising. Low urine iodine was found in 38.5% of soccer players, but only 2% of sedentary students. Goiter, a clinical sign of chronic iodine deficiency, was present in almost half of the soccer players, but only 1% of sedentary students. This is only during one hour of soccer. 38% of players lost more iodine through sweat than excreted in urine the entire day. So if you don't know, the body needs iodine to make thyroid hormones. These hormones control body's metabolism and many other important functions. A deficiency in it can lead to goiter. If you've never seen what goiter looks like, it is not pleasant and it can get pretty intense. If you just Google goiter, you'll find some hectic ones. This is a generous one just to exemplify, you know, 
the cosmetic appearance of it as it develops, but some of them are hectic, dude, when you go on Google Images. So this is basically a deficiency in iodine can lead to goiter or hypothyroidism and will unquestionably impair exercise performance recovery, not to mention slow your metabolism, drop body temperature, worsen body composition, among various other things. But it's your body's stressed out, basically. So it is... Uh, what helps your thyroid produce thyroid hormones. And if you don't have enough, the thyroid works extra hard apparently to make thyroid hormone and can cause the gland to literally grow in size. And here's a really bad example. Left untreated or inadequately treated, the goiter may continue to grow. This is a really hectic one. In very large goiters, the person may have a hard time lowering the head or even swallowing. How many people are operating in a state of mild iodine deficiency perpetually from the amount of sweat they excrete during exercise, hard sports, endurance activities? I don't know. But this study was uh, pretty alarming where it wasn't that intensive of activity either. So the mean losses of iodine, sodium, potassium, and calcium in sweat following a one-hour game were... 52 micrograms of iodine. So that's like, when you look at iodine's recommended daily intake, it's only 150 micrograms per day and values lower than 100 micrograms per liter can indicate insufficient iodine intake. And, you know, further to that, obviously the actual cosmetic manifestations and, you know, physiologic manifestations through side effects systemically, it is pretty problematic. And you end up with this super, you know, aggravated thyroid gland essentially and a lack of adequate thyroid hormone production and it's all a result of insidiously sweating out you know what you need seemingly so like to me these sweat rates were pretty goddamn concentrated you had 52 micrograms for one hour of gameplay where you were the sodium it looks in line with what you would expect from maybe a high end of one liter of sweat loss. If not, you know, maybe one to two liters or something. Um, I could re revisit looking for the study to see the exact amounts, but like these amounts and losses of sodium, potassium, calcium are predictable and seem reasonable for an hour. But this iodine one, I would have never predicted it personally that literally like one third of your intake could be lost in an hour and potentially push you into deficiency territory like that easily because most almost nobody is going to be replacing this based on how much they're sweating so for me this was a no-brainer to add into the formula because if you're using it presumably it is to replace at least a liter of fluid and we are of the impression that one hour of exercise is probably going to be leading to you know, roughly 50 micrograms of loss in a reasonably heavy sweater. So like, I feel like we're kind of essentially just covering the basis with each stick pack of this stuff for us. So that was the justification for the 50 micrograms of iodine included. Shout out to Stan Efforting for bringing forward that literature because it is uh, not commonly known, that's for sure. So we intend to replace what is lost while sweating with this. It's not necessarily to make up for ground that in a pre-existing deficiency because a lot of people do get enough iodine through you know iodized salting their foods etc but you know aggressive sweat concentrations are hard to overlook in this scenario because nobody is really doing more to offset whatever it is that they don't know they lost in sweat so you know worthwhile inclusion hopefully in my opinion so we didn't include sugar because the vast majority of people don't need the extra calories um, they just need water and an individual specific balance of electrolytes sometimes. And obesity rates are still climbing fast. You know, the vast majority of people need less calories as is, and they don't need, in my opinion, insidious liquid sugar calories adding to that burden, which, you know, for a lot of people probably would. Like a lot of people that think they need, I don't know, like a goo carbohydrate thing plus a Gatorade to go do like a basic run like they're just overdoing it in the glucose for sure so also why did we naturally sweeten this product instead of use sucralose so I'm not against sucralose I think it has its use case for sure like in pre-workouts it's pretty goddamn hard to make something that tastes good with the ingredients at high concentrations like Gorilla Mode for example I've tried to naturally sweeten it and it's like a six out of 10 at best versus, you know, like a nine or 10 out of 10 
with artificial sweeteners in it. So for that, like a pre-workout, it's a lot more difficult to justify natural sweeteners when there is a super high concentration of actives that are throwing the taste profile, you know, into disarray and making it taste like shit. So that is where, you know, artificial sweeteners kind of make or break if somebody will even drink it or not. With electrolytes, though, this is like a, it's a formula that really, as is, as a naturally sweetened, if you have a good you know, flavor system that you dial in, you have a good palate for um, really tweaking this stuff. I think our naturally sweetened uh, versions are literally within striking distance of even the artificial ones I tried. Because I did try sucralose based versions of all of these and I actually preferred the naturally sweetened one. It tasted more natural, like something I could drink a high quantity of during intense exercise. Like, I don't know about you guys, but for really long intense bouts of exercise like it starts to become sickeningly sweet artificially sweetened stuff almost gets a little bit overkill to a point that it's nauseating and it's not attractive to be drinking high amounts like on a hike or something so that is where something that tastes natural and is more uh it's not light in flavor but it's more um tolerable in high quantities and it's within like 10 percent of uh as good in taste profile i would say like it's it's really good to a point that it made no sense to, you know, do artificial just because. So for us, this is something that I'm confident to say, if you don't mind some saltiness, you would actually enjoy sipping on it and it tastes great. And I'm happy we naturally sweeten it. And I think that was uh, the move on this formula in general. I think the, the demographic seeking electrolytes too would probably prefer something in general that's naturally sweetened. That's just speculation on my part though. But ultimately, if you can make it natural and taste as good or within striking distance of artificial, then like by all means, why not go natural? So our product, by the way, is available now. If you want to check it out, it is on GorillaMind.com. It'll probably be in retail at some point soonish because we just got into retail recently with our energy drinks. And I imagine these will be, you know, on the radar soon. But for now, they are on our site and... Um, now you can use coupon code MPMD, coupon code MPMD to save 10% on your order, help support me and you know, stuff I'm doing. And I think it's a great formula. I think among the stuff that's out there, this is actually unique enough, tastes good enough, hits the right angles and concentrations and ratios and has enough uh, unique upside to actually justify its inclusion in a otherwise saturated marketplace. So to me, that is you know the whole reason I brought it in and uh, I think you guys will enjoy it. So you can check it out if you want to try it out. And for, you know, other scenarios where contextually it's not appropriate for, like, don't buy it, seriously. Like there's a lot of, like realistically zero to one hour if you go into a exercise session where you're sweating like not a ton, you probably can just get away fine with uh, regular water. You probably don't need an electrolyte formula. So it almost comes to, you know, do you enjoy drinking it too? Like that's a part of this as well. Um, that's part of the reason why I drink it personally as well is literally enjoyment factor for the fluid intake during my training sessions. So yeah, check it out if you guys are interested. So to calculate how much water to drink just to cover your basis and function, regardless of your exercising um, or not, this is actually for baseline just being sedentary. I think the Galpin equation is actually quite a good uh, starting place because it's variable based on body weight. Like it's shocking how many blanket recommendations for recommended daily intakes of different nutrients are based just on one concrete number that applies for like multiple decades of individuals regardless if they're you know morbidly obese or skinny or jacked or anything it's general so it's like a fair rule of thumb i guess some of these recommendations but the galpin equation is based on body weight so it will fluctuate accordingly at a far more granular level which i really appreciate so um, if you don't know, by the way, Andy Galpin is a highly respected PhD human bioenergetics and muscle physiology coach to elite athletes in um, professional sports. And Andrew Huberman has had him on multiple times now to talk all things, you know, sports nutrition, supplementation, hydration, etc. And they came up with, uh, well, Andy presented a calculation to determine your baseline fluid intake per day, not factoring in excessive sweating. And it's pretty on point in my opinion as a starting point. So 
it is half of your body weight in ounces per day. And then on top of that, like that's not factoring in food intake either, which can account for, you know, another 20% of uh, fluid. So for me, you know, I'm 210 pounds, give or take, um, closer to 215 right now, maybe on a bad day, maybe like 208, I don't know, but 210. 105 ounces of water would be my baseline then. So 105 without factoring in peri-workout hydration, which is, you know, hydration in the pre, intra, and or post window of working out. And obviously, you know, that might elevate things if I'm excessively sweating, for sure. But these recommendations cover fluids from water and other beverages, but not diet. So about 20% of daily fluid intake usually comes from food and the rest from drinks. So adding another 20% on top brings my recommended intake to about 126 ounces of water baseline without factoring in peri-workout hydration. And that is about 3.73 liters, which lines up pretty closely with the 3.7 liter general recommendations that often are circulated around for young men. Um, it's 2.7 liters for women is the general circulated recommendation, but I would use the Galpin equation, which is your body weight um, divided by two in ounces plus 20% for you know, factoring in diet. But again, you shouldn't have to actually factor in diet because you're just going to eat the diet. So basically the, you know, body weight divided by, you know, two in ounces essentially is going to cover you for what you are drinking in liquid. So not a whole much, not a whole lot more thought needs to be put into it than that unless you are literally like fasting or depriving the hell out of yourself in a steep deficit. So like for me, it lined up pretty closely with the general recommendations and I wouldn't guarantee it's sufficient, but it seems like, you know, this Galpin equation is variable enough and flexible enough that it's a good general baseline to go off of. And it's definitely a better approach out there than, you know, the one size fits all stuff. To think that every man is going to be good to go on like 3.7, there's no variability or whatever, that would be insane, obviously. So on top of that, how much are you sweating per hour? How intense is the activity? Carbs versus no carbs. Should you use them versus should you not? What is your mineral intake from your diet like regularly? Are you a salty sweater versus not? If you want to get very, very specific, you can calculate your average sweat rate and it has an equation, but personally, I think the simplest way to assess this, and by the way, as far as like, counting out ounces and how to make it simple, like a standard shaker cup. This is a shaker cup that I use all the time. This has a top line of 20 ounces. So like in general for me having, you know, like five of these per day, let's just say I was 200 pounds. Like that's five of these covers your basis for drinking. And then on top of that, you would have food intake, which brings adds your other 20% that you don't really need to think about because you're gonna be eating your meals anyways. And then you just gotta think about peri-workout hydration and that's about it. So like, it makes it pretty simple when it's just like, drink five of these, boom, done. So again, how much are you sweating? You know, what other unique circumstances are imposed on you? What's the simplest way to do it? I think it is to stand on a scale before you exercise, right before, and then right after and modify your rehydration protocol accordingly based on your findings. Like if you lose weight, it's pretty obvious that you got rid of more fluid than you took in. So you should probably hydrate more. If you gained weight though, you probably drank more than you needed to, you should hydrate less. So a good rule of thumb for peri-workout fluid intake is also brought forth in the Galpin equation as well. This might actually be the Galpin equation. I don't know if they call the equation for the baseline, kind of like uh, status quo conservative intake daily too without exercise. But this is on top of, you know, let's just say a 200 pound guy is drinking 100 ounces a day. He's also getting 20 ounces through food. On top of that 120 cumulative ounces, he would also be taking the Galpin equation, body weight in pounds divided by 30 equals the number of ounces to ingest per 15 minutes of exertion on average not necessarily on the quarter hour. So just in general per hour, you wanna be drinking, I guess your body weight in pounds divided by 30 times the number of ounces of water to ingest times four, I guess, if you wanted to do like per hour. Like a lot of people are going to be bottlenecked by time. If they're playing a sport, you can't necessarily just stop and go all the time. And again, even if you're in the gym, it can get annoying having to remember to do things super frequently. So like this is not, set in stone, your performance is going to deteriorate if you wait 30 minutes and double up on the water versus did 15. 
and spread it out. It's not going to be that much of a big deal, but this is the general framework that I think is uh, solid to start by at least and then dial it in from there. In general, most people, you know, pending hydration is solid going into training. You can likely get away with just water with the session with two, one to two servings of a well-rounded electrolyte formula for sessions that are one to two hours more intensive sweating and just drinking water as per the Galpin equation and then diluting the water or putting the electrolytes in at a ratio determined by your needs or just the suggested use as a starting place. But yeah, that is kind of the framework. And I think intense athletics will require some pivoting, of course. Like you might not even have time to drink whatever it is in the middle of your game or what have you. But you can, you know, approach it accordingly, chunk it into bigger blocks of bigger intake rather than, you know, spreading out every 15 minutes. Or if you're a salty sweater and need to push the electrolytes harder, if you blow through your glycogen stores, need carbs on deck for very demanding activities. Like these are all more unique circumstances that justify more unique tailored protocol design. But this is a general guideline you can follow that will serve the majority of us well, um, in my opinion. So, you know, thanks to Galpin, Andy Galpin and Huberman for bringing forth, you know, that great information to create a very easy to digest framework because it can get very overwhelming otherwise. So that is the video. I am, uh, hopefully you guys found that informative, educational, entertaining, whatever it may be. And we'll see if, uh, Logan continues on the path he's on and, uh, you know, or if ethics prevail or what. So we shall see. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe. Check out my blog, moreplaysmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, I'm moreplaysmoredates, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, a couple podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. I don't know what it is. Last I checked, but it was like some percentage of people that watch that aren't subscribed or subscribed and letting you guys know it really helps out the channel if you do subscribe and it tells youtube to recommend more videos like this to other people who may otherwise never get a you know educational just complete over the top length video served to them if they didn't have the video liked or the person subscribed to so it helps out a lot and helps you know tell me what i'm doing is good and worthwhile um if you guys like and subscribe so please do and i look forward to having you guys back on a on the regular content grind in the near future. So hopefully you guys enjoy that and um, I will talk to you guys soon.